What's up, Goofy Goobers? It's your host, Tom Levinobi. We're going to have a fun show today. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. Let me know in the chat down below what you're getting up to today. Today, we are going to be reacting to a new Jubilee video, and it's a whole new series on Jubilee titled Undecided. We're going to see a familiar face who is hosting it, and basically what they're going to do is have two sides, a liberal and conservative side, to debate an issue, and then they have a third party, an undecided group, that by the end of the video will tell you how they feel about the issue at hand. And today's issue is should children be able to transition? And we're going to get to that. As always, we do have Taylor in Nashville. Happy Wednesday or Thursday, apparently, if you're watching from Australia. I just saw someone in the chat is uh, watching from Australia. And it's already Thursday there. So uh, yeah. time's, time warp. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I always forget that I'm dating an Australian myself. And it's just like, oh, yeah, you're you're a whole day ahead of us. You got a whole nother thing going on than what's going on mm -hmm. in our days today. So shout out to all the Australians watching right now. Also drop in the chat where you're watching from. We always like to see the cities, the countries, the continents. And with that, we're going to get into today's video, Should Minors Transition? Let's watch. Antidepressants weren't working. We've been to every single therapist and as children oh, to drive combines. Let me, let me slow it down. Your girl watches videos at two times speed, so let me put it Super in Super brain in action there. <laughs> Antidepressants weren't working. We'd okay. been to every single therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he, him pronouns. I don't even know where to start here. Sex is not assigned at birth, it's established at conception. We have to get to biology here. Today we're bringing a new version of Middle Ground. We'll be exploring the topic, should minors be allowed to medically transition? Do y'all recognize it? There's Gen, chilling on, on Jubilee, hosting this new show, which is super cool. Also, shout out to Jubilee. Make sure you go ahead and give them a follow. I know a lot of you guys wait until we react to their videos to even watch them, but go follow them. They are a great channel who's, you know, starting new conversations every day. So, you know, go give them a little, little cred. We'll the be link introducing videos in the description down below, by the way. Yes, the link is in the description down below. You guys can check that out. Undecided. Undecided group, and they'll be listening to a discussion between liberals and conservatives, and the undecided group will pick a side after each prompt. 
transitioning has become a social media trend. Absolutely agree. I mean, it is just skyrocketing the amount of children that you see falling into this, and we need to stop it. Absolutely not. People said the same thing about people coming out being lesbian, gay, or bisexual as it got more normalized, as people became more accepting of like their children and things like that. They're like, everybody wants to be gay. Now, social media is around, people my age, like we see other trans people, and being aware that that's something that's being accepted by other people makes you more comfortable with yourself and like comfortable with like internalizing that it's okay to be trans in public. Okay, let's pause. So it's, it's gonna be a difficult conversation to have, right? Uh, Cause you can only go for the most part based of how you feel with the lack of like studies and research on what's going on right now. I personally feel like social media is helping to push forward a narrative of identifying with some other gender or, you know, choosing to be non-binary trans this, trans that, because obviously you have influencers that are doing it now. You have large communities on the internet that are finding people who are maybe feeling depressed or anxious or incongruent with their bodies. And then they're more quickly falling down the path of transgenderism and transition. Now what's going to truly dictate whether or not this is a trend is not what's happening now, but what happens down the line in people choosing to detransition, to drop the identities that they've currently chosen for themselves. And it's really hard to get data and stats on just exactly uh, just exactly what rate that is happening now. So, pers- in my personal opinion, I believe that what's happening right now is a social media trend, and you'll hear from a lot of trans people, and specifically trans youths, saying, you know, I didn't know what I was until I found somebody on social media talking about it. But that could be the case for many other things. I think what we're gonna find, though, is in a few years from now, the rate of detransitioning and people dropping these labels or stopping hormones or stopping their medical transition is going to be far higher than it ever was before. So that will dictate whether or not we're sitting in a trend. I think you're falling prey to the survivorship bias, which is just sort of, you're overlooking all of the cases of people who either weren't able to come out because they weren't comfortable or safe to do so, or they either died due to suicide or other mental health reasons. But over time, if you look at left-handedness, that skyrocketed in a similar rate as people became more accepting to it. I I, I reject that, but. Let me me ask you something. If that's the case, if more people are transitioning simply because it's more acceptable, Mm -hmm. then how can your side also say that there's a trans genocide happening? Those are completely opposite. No, I know you didn't, but you're, but the people, the liberals say that all the time. They're saying that there's a trans genocide because of for some reason. So I'm just curious as to how you would square that circle. Can we Mm. define what the trans genocide, I guess, narrative is as raised by her? I would like her to answer that because she's the one that brought it up. Yeah, because, so we hear people saying because simply because because legislation is being passed across the country that is banning minors from being able to transition, that automatically means that those children would commit suicide. And that is simply an abusive statement in of itself. Statistically, a lot of minors who aren't able to transition who would like to do end up. Why don't we have this why don't we have this why don't we have the same suicide rates in the past? That we that were that if, if that was the case, how Let's could we from. how could we have known that the people who were committing suicide were transgender if they didn't feel safe to come out? When you look at like um, members of each generation that identify as LGBTQ or in that community, it's like less than two percent. And then for some reason, as soon as we get to Generation Z, it's twenty percent. Now, some of you may argue, okay, this is just because it's more open, it's more accepting now. Everyone, it's okay to be that. But then in the same beat, you guys will say that if you don't accept them, they're more likely to commit suicide or something. But it kind of sounds like a double-edged sword. So that didn't sound double-edged to me. It, it sounded pretty accurate. Like if you're not accepting of somebody, they're more likely to be self-hating. Like if you're telling somebody that they're not allowed to do something, they shouldn't do something, they're not fitting into their own body, especially experiencing dysphoria in itself, it, it, it's a mental battle in general. Like. So, okay. so to clarify your point, I think you're saying that acceptance is what's leading to it. Is that right? It, to... It's a, a mixture between self-acceptance, outer acceptance. It's a conversation between nature and nurture. Like, It's just such a hard conversation to get down to the bottom of. How do you gauge the acceptance of a certain society? How do you engage how alienated... How do you gauge how alienated one would be within a society? I think for the most part, we can all see that the world is becoming much more uh, progressive on the issue of gender and identity and all these different things. And yes, 2% to 20% is an insane jump and how anybody can see that and think, 
that's just like natural numbers, you know, occurring because of acceptance in, in our country kind of does blow my mind. And yeah, they do have to sort of contend with the idea that their narrative is that this country is super oppressive towards trans people. But they're also arguing that we're so accepting that, uh, you know, the numbers are skyrocketing and people are choosing to take on this identity. So which which one do you think is more likely to be the case? I would probably argue that acceptance mixed with social media, mixed with other mental health issues, and a slew of other things is leading to a rise in identification with this. But again, we'll wait and see. Like in a few years, what is it going to look like? Is it still going to be 20% of you know the generation identifying as LGBT in some way, shape, or form? We, we shall see, uh, because we can get more accepting, guys. Things can go further. <laughs> See, here's the problem with that. There have been two, there's two longitudinal studies alone that I could cite. In Sweden, from 1973 to 2003, they looked at a mm -hmm. large number of subjects who had before transition and after transition, and they had m worse comorbidities, they had worse mental health issues. Sweden is a very tolerant, liberal, progressive country. A study this year, published in Denmark, 2023, 42-year longitudin longitudinal study, and what they found is that the mental health issues did not decline, they actually were augmented. It was worse for individuals who thought that by transitioning they would solve their mental health issues, it actually got worse. It doesn't help, it doesn't solve these issues, it shows it's a contagion, that is the key word. Let's, let's pause there then. What are your guys' thoughts on, let's say, maybe that's a pretty popular figure that's been mentioned when it comes to a social media influencer that's... I imagine it's gotta be Dylan Mulvaney, I don't know what else, like, they would be redacting. I can't think of another person that would be as big. Right, Taylor? Yeah, Taylor, you look confused. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but it's also just strange to me that this this gentleman made a pretty salient point or at least inserted some very, like, fact-based material into mm -hmm. the conversation. Uh, and instead of giving people an opportunity to respond to that, they just immediately pivoted into talking about trans influencer. Now, maybe that was an edit on Jubilee's part and it wasn't Gen's moderation, but don't like how that was just kind of like, I mean, I, I mean, I guess I'm grateful that that information was included and submitted, but I wish that we could have seen some of the response to that. Yeah, 100 percent, because that is what the longest study I think that has been done on the subject matter. And it's only 30 years, guys. That's crazy. Only a 30 year long study. And that's the longest one we have on transgenderism and transitioning and suicidal ideation versus, you know, like attempted suicide and successful suicide, all of these different things. That is wild. But with that longitudinal study, they found it's a no go for minors in uh, Sweden is one of the you know few countries now which is going to be many i think in, in the near future here that has decided if you are a minor and you're seeking medical transition we will not do that for you in this country and they're the one with the longest study so it is something to uh marinate on risen to fame because of that she's just doing what she's doing i don't think that she's doing anything wrong okay he do you think that oh, has pronouns are she her that's transphobic do you, think, he. do you think that has inspired uh trans kids i think she's also inspired allies to see the human being behind the pronouns and the makeup and the dress and to see that there's someone who is going through a story and that watching her go through that story enabled us to see the humanity behind her. He is degrading she women. You see a great disregard. I mean, look at the look at the product that he was supposed to be promoting. It has fallen into. Her you know, while I may agree with a lot of the points that our, our man Arthur is going to bring forward during this, uh, you know, back and forth, this debate, I do not appreciate the tone with which he is bringing them forward. If you are truly there to do y your job, which in this case is to sway the three people sitting behind you, you really got to chill. You got to take a chill pill. You got to breathe a little bit. You have to take what they're saying and recognize that the three people sitting across from you are not going to change their minds. It seems like the one with the blue hair here is trans, the one next to her is trans, the, the mother has trans kids. They're not changing their minds here. So is it worth all the extra energy of, you know, interjecting your own point and saying he, 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 and, you know, coming at them aggressively? No, because the three people behind you are watching all of that and going, ah, oh, you know, I don't know if I can get behind that. Just calmly get your points out because they're going to hear them. They don't need the extra uh, aggression and it's not going to help them change their minds. Yeah. And to be fair, you talk about extra energy. I think it can take extra energy sometimes when in a discussion that you feel passionately about to 
not respond with emotion or not respond with a lot of directness. But that's just the extra measure that you have to take if you want to be persuasive, because it's kind of like the the old adage, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And until you're kind of able to demonstrate uh, a willingness to meet people where they're at and entertain their position in good faith, uh, then they're not going to listen to you, even if you're right. So being right is only half the battle when it comes to trying to persuade people and bring them to a different point of view. Yeah, especially it seems like this undecided camp is pretty young, too. So you just mm-hmm. you always got to keep that in mind that your tone is everything when talking to people who are sitting on the fence of an issue. Our so, pronouns um, are she, and, and with all due respect to me, it like isn't the people who following them the are not the youth. Okay. That's not a phobia. <laughs> let's Telling stop the here. Truth is not a phobia. Let's stop here and phobia. let's uh, go over to the undecided group. Okay, this is the interesting part. All right, so undecided group, you guys are kind of like the common section. Which side did you resonate with most, liberals or conservatives? Okay, they're gonna get up and move. Okay. So why did you resonate most with the liberal group? Trends pass. Mm. Trends end. So calling it a trend is saying that these people's identities are just going to go away. And I don't think that's fair. Why mm. do you think that it's not transphobic to misgender? Because the concept of misgendering is false. There are two sexes. There's male and female. Well, it's, it's, it's in the chromosomes. It goes beyond superficial or secondary characteristics. He is a male. He was born a male. He will remain a male. It doesn't matter how many chemicals he puts into his body or how many body parts are cut off. And I'll say this again. Telling the truth is not a mental illness. Do you have a response to that? It's like, calm down, calm down. It's okay. She, <laughs> she clearly disagrees, right? Which is interesting because she's in the undecided camp, but it seems clear in her rhetoric that she does very much have a side on the issue um but she just asked you a very uh, like normal question and with a very calm demeanor just to go i believe that no matter what so and so does uh their sex which they were born with and, and conceived with is going to remain for for the rest of their lives that that's just just simply my opinion i don't think there's anything that you can do to run away from that although people may try that's all you have to say you don't have to like <laughs> come at her like that yeah, um, I think that there is a difference between sex and gender, and I know you're going to disagree with me, but transgender is its own thing. And he- Okay, so she's not undecided. I think that's pretty clear. She she has a, a strong stance on the issue. He can, she can be... See, no, don't try to blame that on me. You are using the wrong pronouns for this woman, and you're trying to no. influence something. Do you have a specific, specific question that truth. you like to ask the liberal group? I would just like to hear more from them because I feel like it was very one-sided. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Why didn't they edit out him walking over to the other side? (laughs) (laughs) I just love the little pitter-patter of the feet. (laughs) So you sat more on the conservative side. Do you want to explain why you decided to come here? Yeah, um, so I think I mean, there are, I mean, it is just factual that there are more people transitioning or at least coming out, not even just as transgender, but just, you know, within the LGBTQ community as a whole. And so I do see, you know, I think for me, it does become a little bit grayer when you start to say, okay, is that because people are being like influenced to transition or is it because it's more accepting and people are feeling more open and safe about coming out? And I think, you know, when you're in, you know, a friend group or when you, you know, associate with certain people, I think you are likelier to maybe, you know, explore your gender a little bit more or, you know, look more into those avenues. And I think that can influence someone to transition if, you know, maybe beforehand that wouldn't have been a consideration. Do you have a specific question that you'd like to ask either side? Yeah, I guess I would like to ask, you know, the liberal side, you know, and I can't necessarily trace it back to a specific time when this happened, but I do think we have seen recently, you know, a rise in people identifying with genders that aren't necessarily within a binary. Would you say that's a rise? You know, how would you, I guess, account for that? I think, as I said earlier, that is just accounted by survivorship bias. People previously were not comfortable enough with coming out, and that's where that difference comes from. And eventually, that skyrocketing rate will even out. Um, I definitely do think that that is kind of a factor of it, that, I mean, you know, people are just coming out more and are feeling more accepted. And I absolutely do believe that, you know, that is a good that social media has done. But I do also kind of push back on the idea that it's just completely that. Like, I, you know, when you look at figures who, you know, rise to prominence, like, for example, D- Dil- um, Dylan Mulvaney, You know, these are people with huge platforms that, you know, are reaching to, you know, younger people who are at stages in their lives where, you know, they are exploring ideas of gender and gender expression and identity. And so 
I guess personally, I would push back a little bit against the idea that it's just people who, had it been more accepting in the past, they would have come out. I do think there is, you know, a rise. I mean, I feel like the numbers just don't really account for it necessarily being just that group of people. I think there are people, especially youth, who are identifying more kind of on the gender spectrum or as transgender that maybe wouldn't have before. So yeah, I mean, let's let's try this with like virtually anything else that becomes a trend on social media and see if that would be the same. We covered a story on this show a while back of. Uh, people with Tourette's that started getting really popular on TikTok and becoming influencers who were just like showing the tics that they had throughout the day or how they got through class or how they cook food and all this stuff. And these people were getting millions of views, millions of followers. And all of a sudden here in the United States and other countries uh, where young women in particular are on TikTok a lot, girls started popping up with Tourette's and they started becoming their own like influencers and making videos about it. They were going to see doctors here in the US and they would have the same tics as a popular, you know, British influencer who had Tourette's. So if we like it or not, like these things pop up in our life and we are influenced that by them, whether consciously or subconsciously. Now, many of the doctors argued these girls are naturally taking on uh, like these Tourette like tics. It's actually another uh, name for, for the affliction, but we won't get all that deep into it. But it's influenced by the fact that they've watched so much social media where this is involved. So you could subconsciously be, you know, taking on a transgender identity and, you know, changing your pronouns and going to, you know, gender clinics and all these things and not realizing that the influence is coming from things like social media. And yeah, that's part of society accepting things more as, you know, we have trans influencers and celebrities and all this stuff, but it also is a marker of some sort of social contagion. How many people do you see saying that they have like ADHD and they're depressed and they're anxious and this is becoming a super popular thing on social media as well? Now, some of that might be occurring naturally, and maybe we are naturally on an uptick in our in our generation of mental health issues. But also, do you think that maybe the media and the entertainment that we're consuming is influencing us down those paths? I think it could be a great mixture of uh, both things happening right now. And again, a few years down the line, we'll see how much of this sticks. The girl who went to the liberal side, who's standing over there now, she did say something that was true. She said, you know, trends come and go. Trends will pass. And she's absolutely right when she says that. We just have to wait and see if it does. Uh, and I will place my bet that it will. She'll probably place her bet that it won't. Oh, you're the only undecided. Can you clarify why you still remain undecided? Um, yeah, I think the reason I remained undecided was because although I appreciate um, the presentations of both sides and I see both of their points, I was still a little bit unclear um, as far as which what's like each opinion was on each side. So um, I would just be curious to ask the liberal side, do you guys, is there any like evidence that you guys could present that would suggest um, that transitioning lowers the rate of suicide? I would say on one hand, there there is data that suggests that um, trans minors who are not able to medically transition when they do want to, their suicidality um, attempt rate is around 40%, and that drops to below 10% when they are able to transition. Moreover, if I would, wasn't able to transition and I didn't have any support in my life, I would probably kill myself. Okay. Uh, let's get into that. So they, she said minors that, you know, couldn't transition or haven't had the chance, 40%. And then when they get the chance to actually transition or, you know, start down that path, it drops down to 10%. First of all, when you're a minor, uh, it's really hard to even dictate what exactly that means. And... A lot of these studies, I'm going to guess, are based on self-reporting, which means just asking them, you know, do you feel suicidal? Are you experiencing suicidal ideation? And with that being said, you know, how long are these studies going? We know uh, when we were young, probably, you've had moments where you've been just in the pits, right? And super depressed about everything. One thing changes in your life, you get something that you want, and all of a sudden you're on, on top of the world. Our emotions fluctuate and fluctuate very, very quickly. And sometimes they'll fluctuate based on things that we think are good and healthy for us and they end up down the line not being healthy. That's why it's more important uh, to get longer longitudinal studies than it is to necessarily self get self-reporting from teens who are saying, yeah, I feel depressed now and once I was able to transition, I, I don't anymore. And uh, Taylor, you watched this. You, you took it upon yourself to look into exactly what this individual is citing. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it was there was an article on the Human Rights Council website that uh, referred to this study, and I looked into it a little bit, looked into some stuff that our friend Colin Wright and Christina Buttons at Realities Last Stand had written about it. And a couple of the other problems uh, with, with the study is that uh, a lot of the – there are com- comorbid- comorbidities uh, of mental illnesses that are associated with the people who are being asked – uh, who are identifying as transgender and saying that I have suicidal ideation as a trans person, those people can have mental illnesses like depression, uh, eating disorders, any manner of things uh, that go into it before identifying as trans. And if you ask people with just depression or just bulimia or just those other types of mental health comorbidities, the same question, their rates are much higher than the general population as well. So that that was a big factor. Uh, that that would kind of undercut this argument. Yeah, when you when you talk to uh, specifically, you know, trans people who have been down the path of transition, when you read some of the studies uh, and some of the longer ones like that out of out of Sweden, the numbers are not looking great as to depression subsiding and suicidal ideation subsiding based on medical transition. They just do are they're stark uh, to be to be quite frankly, uh, and. You, there's so many other comorbidities that these people are often experiencing, as Taylor spoke to. There's a slew of other mental health issues that can be intermingled with experiencing gender dysphoria. And I feel like that's not being addressed, but hopefully we get to that throughout the rest of this video. Now, we did and get real a- quick. Oh, oh yeah, I'm just going to finish that thought. Uh, I did pull up the actual numbers from that study in Sweden that you're referring to. It says one long term study on mm-hmm. adults in Sweden shows that 10 to 15 years after sex reassignment surgery, the suicide rate of those patients was 19 times higher than that of comparable peers. So, I mean, it's just at this point, we're just going to be like throwing, you know, studies. numbers that that disagree yeah. with the studies that they're throwing at us. And it's hard to get down to the bottom of, uh, especially with the way that medicine is being treated now and how political it has become. Now, we did get a $50 super chat. We do read those immediately on this show from Lilith Requiem, who says, hey, Amala, Bri- uh, Buck Angel just talked with a lovely trans woman named Brianna Ivy, who transitioned at 13 and has had all the major gender care surgeries, only to be ignored after they botched her bottom surgery and is talking about her experience now at 22. Wow. I'll have to check that video out. I do love Buck. Uh, He is a friend of the show here and has been on the show. You guys can check out the videos where he has been featured. Um, I have a feeling there are going to be so many more stories like that of Brianna Ivy, and I hope that that's addressed here uh, in this video. We're only going to know the real scope of this, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the line when all of the dust settles on the political arguments and we're left with the rubble of the people's lives who have been directly impacted by this rhetoric and by medical transitioning. So we shall see. The conservatives, uh, you guys were discussing social media contagion. Could you present any other like arena as far as um, other instances where we've seen social media have that influence on? I'd love to add, just every aspect of mainstream media. So um, CNN, like all mainstream news sources, um, when we talk about even like major corporations, we have Pride Month for God's sake, right? We have an entire month where all corporations, all major corporations, even the government, you know, President Joe Biden is putting a pride flag. It seems like every aspect of our like top dog, like main people in society are promoting it, right? Okay, let's pause. You don't even need Mm -hmm. to talk about gender or pride or anything to make the argument uh, and to answer the question that she just asked. What is social media for? And what do, you know, corporations, individuals, influencers use social media for? To influence you, to participate in things, whether that be, you know, buying certain products, doing certain things with your, your life and your lifestyle, making a choice like transitioning. It is quite literally why we use social media and why it is such a driving force in our lives. Do you see all the girls running around, you know, Florida and California with their BBLs now and their face is full of filler and, you know, their lips are are pouted to where they look insane now? Where did that influence come from? It came from social media. It came from an image. When people are doing, you know, detox teas and juice cleanses and eating those little sugar bears that Kim Kardashian shares on her Instagram, where did that come from? social media influence when they're identifying with certain mental illnesses or anything like we use social media 
to influence and to persuade and to move people down a certain path. Now, you hope that that's a healthy one, but sometimes it can be things like transitioning and thinking that your gender is somehow incongruent with your sex. So that is the very nature of social media itself. So to not look at this and think that a trend could be a part of this just kind of maybe I think we're just getting too in the weeds and getting too complex in the conversation because that is what we use these platforms for. Yeah, and, and then, I mean, yeah, if you I think go, you hit the nail on the head a minute ago with uh, referencing the TikTok Tourette's, uh, the the massive uh, exponential increase in people manifesting those symptoms, and we even reacted to videos previously on this channel of medical professionals talking about the fact that yeah, I used to have this level of occurrence in my clinic, and now it's this level, and they were trying to make sense of it, and these they were like clearly this is playing an influence influence in that proliferation of the identification of these symptoms and that to me that's what this girl asked for and uh you had already mentioned it but you, you had you answered her question perfectly and uh, it's too bad that he kind of took the other route of oh well they're just preaching this pride stuff from all these other directions i mean that's true and maybe in that sense he's identifying like another slice of the pie chart if we're trying to explain the the proliferation of transgender identification in youth in the modern time Times, then yeah, that's probably a factor is like this cultural uh, influencers that's being institutionalized in the government and different places like that's it's being pushed in addition to what you're seeing on social media trends, uh, in addition to maybe increased acceptance, like these are all pieces of the pie, but it's simplistic uh, on one side or the other to say, well, it's just a social media trend that highlights 100% of it, or it's just increased acceptance that highlights 100% of it, we need a little more nuance in the discussion. Yeah, dude, like, in, in the same way, that you're gonna be seeing a bunch of women get their BBLs and their lip filler dissolved in like five to 10 years down the line, you're gonna see the same thing with people choosing to detransition from uh, transgenderism and these new gender identities that they're taking on because it is a social contagion. That's what's happening. Now that doesn't mean that it won't stick for some people and that they won't continue down the full progression of transitioning into their adulthood and you know, until they, until they leave the earth. But it is to say that there's going to be a lot of people who take on these identities and then drop off. Go down to like social media, um, everyone's promoting it, right? Each Instagram, or not, maybe not Twitter anymore, or X now, but TikTok, there's, there's trends, there's um, things that are happening where it is being promoted. And the fact that there's influencers, I think is just proving the fact that it is indeed a trend. Gender dysphoria is a mental illness. It is a break with reality. I'll start at where I've said before, there are two sexes. It's determined not just by external characteristics, but by chromosomes. When somebody dies and is buried and 400 years later, if they exhume the body and they test those bones, they're going to see that it's an XX or an XY, it's a male or a female. It's a mental issue and you want to treat it that way. You treat it with counseling, with therapy, reflecting reality, helping the person be a, to be comfortable with the sex that they're born with, sex. What do you guys think wonder. about that? Uh, um, it's calling it a mental illness. Yes, I want to respond to your comment about bones and skeletons. I study bioanthropology um, and actually they're moving in a direction where they're using the terminology like assumed or, or estimated gender because there is large um, overlap between the general sort of uh, estimations. Also, no one's going to dig up someone's bones unless they've already consented to donating their skeleton somewhere. No one just goes gra grave robbing for that. But that's, that's oh. it. <sighs> That's not the point being made. And yeah, the language and literature surrounding all of our science is going to change so long as this stuff continues to be injected into it. I mean, I, I don't think that that's a, a valid argument to make, but here we are. Uh, and I don't think he means literally digging up the bodies of other human beings to check their sex. I think he was just talking hypothetically as that would be the case if that were to happen to a transgender person. It, that's let's, irrelevant. Let's hear, let's hear well, a little bit. The point is... It's irrelevant to bring it up then. No, no, no. It is relevant to point out that sex is determined at birth and it doesn't change. But what's the point you're making with the skeleton example? The point that it doesn't change even over long periods of time. I'd like to Thank hear you. a little bit more from Thank you for your both of you. If you, you're walking around life constantly being told something like what you're supposed to identify as and you feel other than, like, of course, as time goes on, you're going to feel worse and worse about that specific thing. I don't think there's a reason to transition if you don't have a mental illness. Like... There's something wrong in That's your like brain. That's like saying you that, shouldn't cut no, your hair because you don't no. want long hair. Wow, anymore. that is so not a comparison. No. So, so when when, wow. when when you when you I mean when when I when it's it's the opposite concept of gender or body dysmorphia. So when you look in the mirror, 
and you see what's wrong with, like you see, you have an uncomfortability with your secondary sex characteristics. And so the treatment is to change that to m match with what you, what you want it to be. But I mean, he's right, you can't change your sex, but it's in the brain. You treat the body to help the brain. It's not any different. And, and honestly, I'm somebody who, I don't think you should be, we should stigmatize mental illness. That's the whole point is, you know, I have anxiety, PTSD from when I was in the military and everything else. I don't think we should be stigmatizing mental illnesses. And so I think that calling it for what it is, is just accepting that and it actually helps with treatment and to what you're treating, because you're treating the brain. You have to go to a therapist, you have to go all of that. So I, I think it's no issue to call it. I think-, I think Shout out to Sarah. Sarah always holds it down on Jubilee. <laughs> Second episode she's been on and just kills it every single time. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And the reason that there's so much back and forth as to whether or not we call this a mental illness or a mental disorder is because mental health has been stigmatized. If you call it a mental disorder, it's somehow inherently negative and therefore we must take it out or recharacterize it in the DSM-5 so that nobody can call this a mental disorder or a mental illness. But it is exactly that, right? If I was, you know, waking up every morning and thinking, you know, that I should be 300 pounds, but I'm stuck in the body that I'm in, you would say that I have a mental health problem. And it's the same thing for the people who are born with a certain sex and think that their gender should reflect something different. It is an incongruence, uh, you know, between the mind and the body and thus is a disorder. If the order is that you are born in a male body and should think that you should be in that male body, and for some reason you think that you should be in a female body, things are not in order. It is therefore a disorder. <laughs> and if most human beings are born with the sex and identify with their sex and can recognize that there's congruence between those two things and you feel an incongruence, you have a disorder. That doesn't make it negative. It doesn't mean that you should be stigmatized in any way. It's just factual at the end of the day. Hmm. And real quick, this is where the logic of like gender affirming care kind of loses me a little bit, because to your example a minute ago, uh, if you did believe that you were supposed to be in a 300 pound body, then according to their logic, you should be stuffed full of Twinkies until you weigh 300 pounds. Right. And that's the right way to uh, treat you. And when in reality, the way that you should be treated is to accept yourself and be ushered back to the reality that no, you don't belong in this dysmorphic or this, this body that you have this dysmorphia about, you belong in your own body, you can accept yourself. So the question becomes, how do we best get you to accept reality and get and get you to accept yourself and help walk you through that process. That's what the treatment should keep as its North Star and look like. But instead, we're essentially telling bulimic people they need to get liposuction in order to fit the body that they think that they are. And they're, regardless of uh, whether that has harms to them or to the broader population by preaching that as something that should be normalized or institutionalizing it in uh, our medical uh, uh, diagnoses and such. Yeah. And I'm like, we're all actively watching, you know, other people who are dealing with afflictions that you could argue are similar to gender dysphoria. You all have probably seen, uh, you know, this young woman, Eugenia Cooney, who's all over the internet, and she clearly is struggling with anorexia. And she looks far skinnier than the pictures that I'm even showing you right now uh, in this, you know, modern time that we're in right now. Uh, and nobody is looking at her and saying, yes, keep going, you know, keep eating less and less and less. You need to fight to be skinnier. You're still not at the body that you think you should have. And you need to, you know, stop eating until you completely are down to the skeleton. Nobody is saying that to her. You go to her comments and people are saying, I hope you get help. I hope there's somebody there that you can talk to. I hope there's somebody who can usher you into a future where you're eating more and you feel healthier and you feel better because this is not the way that your body's supposed to look. Yet with transgenderism, for some reason, we just cover our eyes and go, la, 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 like, no, it, we should allow them to be whatever it is that they want to be and whatever surgery they need to get to be on that path, we will give them whatever, whatever, you know, medication cocktail they need to have to be on that path, we will give them. The comments, the comments section of those with transgenderism and, you know, gender dysphoria looks far different than that of somebody who's struggling with anorexia or bulimia or, you know, you name any other, you know, incongruent view that you have of your body which is just wild to me. I don't know. I don't know.
The brain, you don't cut the body, though. I mean, if somebody has bulimia or anorexia, you treat the reason why they (laughs) perceive themselves incorrectly. If somebody has dysmorphia, you don't say, well, just cut off a body part. But this is a complete violation of the Hippocratic Oath. Gender dysphoria is a mental health condition, and the treatment for this condition is to do a medical transition if that person chooses not in Sweden, not in Finland, not in France, and not in, you know, any other place where they're actually allowing doctors to be honest about the repercussions and about the outcomes. So it's just so crazy to me that we are jumping to blind affirmation when we have so much evidence that dictates that we should be moving in the complete opposite direction. Medical transition should be a complete last resort. I mean, you have used every single other option possible. You've had every single other conversation you could have with this person. And in my opinion, should not be offered for years down the line when you are in a doctor-patient relationship with somebody who is struggling with gender dysphoria. Unless this person is going to, you know, start taking like hormones on the black market or harm themselves in some way, shape, or form. That is the last ditch effort that you should use on an individual. And even then, you should be trying to, you know, do what you can to stop them from making that decision in any way possible to have those procedures done. It won't go away with just a simple pill. It's gender dysphoria. It has nothing to do with sex and bones and and your DNA. Do you think children are capable of making that decision? Let Let me pose a question. Homosexuality actually used to be considered as a mental illness. Do you think there's any correlation here with what's going on currently with the trans movement? It it has to do with the way you present yourself. And again, I I call it sex dysphoria because it's dysphoria of your sex, but it has to do with your secondary sex characteristics that you're presenting to society. You know, in a lot of regards, and even Deborah So wrote this in End of Gender, she, she actually advocated for this because the same hormone imbalance in the womb that causes more you know, femininity and homosexuality seems to be very similarly tied to gender dysphoria as well. It's just a, it's, it's a further step along the way. It's a further, you know, condition. And, and I, I agree where I use, I guess I use mental illness and mental health condition synonymously, essentially. So I think what's interesting about this topic is that, you know, we need to consider both statistics as well as personal anecdotes. If you guys don't mind, do you want to share a little bit about your personal experiences with this particular topic? Yeah, so I actually, I didn't even know that trans people existed until I was around like 19, I think. I just, that information never came to me. Um, I'm 25 right now. I didn't really realize I was trans until I was 22, and I started medically transitioning when I was 23. I've, I've experienced depression for most of my life, probably since I was like 13 or so, and um, a lot of suicidal ideation throughout high school and early in college. But pretty much around the time I had, I guess, felt comfortable with my like where I'd gone and transitioning, that had largely decreased pretty much entirely. And this is and this is what's interesting because I know when we talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, every transsexual that I know that transi- that you know we started feeling dysphoria around the very time that we became self-aware around the age of four years old. Um, but yeah, I mean, I knew around the age of four that there was something different. I wanted to be the opposite sex. I knew I wasn't the opposite sex, but it was something that I wished you know I could. I knew that there was something different. Um, and you know, I tried to dress on at four years old and went from there, and then transitioned later in life when. Um, You know, I finally accepted it myself. Man, these stories are so sad. Like, and it's interesting that the same sort of trap is laid, even from somebody who now stands on the more conservative end of the argument of, I tried on a dress when I was four. What does trying on a dress have to do at all with wanting to be, you know, the opposite sex? And what's really sad is that instead of, you know, going on the path to accept the body that you were given and find out, you know, how do I express myself within this body that makes me feel, you know, comfortable and makes me love myself? They've gone down the furthest path of just like alteration and trying to fit into a box that has been created in order to make them feel self, themselves feel more at home. Now, I think you can augment that and it can sort of give you uh, positivity and maybe decrease suicidal ideation in a way if you've perceived that this is where you need to be and are now, you know, pushing yourself down that path. But 
I mean, I can't stress enough, it is the furthest thing from being an individual and being your unique self when you go down the path of, of medical transitioning. And while they may view it as this very triumphant thing, I feel so comfortable now, it's great that you do feel comfortable. And I'm glad that you're in a more positive headspace than you were before, but you did not achieve that through acceptance. It's in fact quite the opposite of acceptance. So transgenderism and this gender stuff is so often packaged as, you know, being unique and fighting for acceptance and tolerance when I, logically it seems like you're doing the exact opposite. Like you're, you're placing yourself inside a box. You're fighting for something that wasn't given to you, you know, biologically. And instead of just accepting the life that was handed to you, you're running from yourself at, you know, the fastest pace you possibly can, and now advocating that other people be able to do the same thing and at an even faster rate than you did it. This person saying, I started recognizing that I was trans at 22, transitioned at 23. Do y'all know how fast a year goes by? That is a blink, you know, in, in the span of our lives. And they seem to be advocating that somebody should be able to do it sooner than they did, that their transition took too long and if that does not terrify you, I don't know what does. Like maybe our perceptions of time are, are very different. And of course they are. But a year is so quick to have made that decision and to be started on a medical program uh, towards transitioning. That blows my mind. I'd be curious to hear your perspective as someone, I think you mentioned that you have kids that yes. have transitioned. Yes, I have that magical uterus. My, 11, my third child came out at 11 and told us that he was a boy. He was assigned female at birth. And so he socially transitioned, obviously, because he was only 11. Uh, he is now an 18-year-old college university student and thriving. Um, and then my uh, youngest child came out as a trans girl at the age of 15. So. Uh, Let's sit down, guys. Come a little closer. <clears throat> Let's have a talk. And it's gonna be a short one. What are the odds? Ask yourself, what are the odds that that happens to you as an individual, that you have two kids that at separate points in their lives come out as trans to you? What are the odds? Um, I live this with my children. Um, I made the trek to the emergency room with suicide. Um, a suicide attempt and a suicide plan with each of my children. Did at any point did your opinion on this is a gender dysphoria or, or a mental illness change as you know you've had actual kids that has transitioned? My opinion hasn't changed. It's a mental health condition, but antidepressants weren't working. We before uh, Mitchell came out, we tried everything. We'd been to every single therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he, him pronouns. And that was all it took to make things better for him initially. Oh gosh, <laughs> this makes me so sad, man. You mean to tell me antidepressants weren't working to cure your kid's depression? Are we at all surprised that antidepressants and pharmaceuticals are not the answer when it comes to a kid who is experiencing deep despair and don't get me wrong i feel for this mother like to you know the utmost extent that you can it's a very hard thing to go through and when your child is struggling i imagine there's anything that you would entertain in order to make that pain go away but the argument that antidepressants were not working for my child so gender care was the answer oh gosh gets to, gets me actually and then we did the medical transition you know, I don't even know where to start here. It's like sex, again, sex is not assigned at birth. It's established at conception. We have to get to biology here. And the second thing is we're seeing like this move. I mean, you were mentioning the academic setting. Notice how the, the academic terms are changing, but this is a result of pressure. This is a result of societal pressure. It's That's fine. what happened with homosexuality, by the way. Homosexuality was recognized as unhealthy behaviors. Now, whether you call it a mental illness or a, a deviant behavior or destructive behavior, that's a, that's a point of debate. It's an unhealthy behavior for sure. And certainly it's the case with transgenderism, somebody cutting off healthy body parts. We have seen numerous detransitioners now coming forward they had severe health and mental problems like the ones that you've talked about. But we find, we find that, psych I have a friend, Kevin, Kevin Witt. He's an outspoken activist. He's been on, been on commercials to protect children from sex mutilation. He was abused as a kid. He was, he was beaten by his dad. He was molested by older kids when he was in school. He struggled with identity issues. These are horrific traumas that he endured. And not once okay. did a counselor ever 
address those deeper issues. That's what needs to be happening. Now let's actually hear from the undecided group. Yeah, that's something to talk about with especially kids who are dealing with these things. There could be so many other things going on that are just not being explored because you've decided, okay, well, he, him pronouns was the answer and it is is gender dysphoria. Now she claims to have explored everything, so we will you know, give credence to that and assume that that is the case. But there are so many other things that happen in children's lives that can lead them down a path to depression and there's other things to you know look at what is their school life like what is home life like are they active are they eating healthy are they being taken care of are there any signs of abuse be it you know bullying abuse from adults sexual abuse anything there are so many things that could be underlying factors they could have other psychological comorbidities that are just coming naturally uh, to them in some way shape or form and a lot of that goes unexplored if your kid says, you know, oh, I'm a boy and I feel like a girl. And then you just jump to the gender therapist. So many other things could be going on. So on the side of group, which side do you resonate with more? So why did you choose the liberal side? I do think it's a mental health condition. I, I don't like calling it an illness. Everyone has things they don't like about their bodies. I don't think we're calling everyone mentally ill. It's interesting how you brought up conce conception and saying that gender is decided at conception because- Sex is the term, that's what I said, not gender. I said sex. Sex, sorry. Sex is decided at conception because- Established. Established, okay. It's Someone very close to me is trans and so hearing it from people who identify as trans themselves. You can talk about statistics and facts all day, but if you actually listen to people and what they're going through and their experience, I feel like it's just much deeper. You were on the undecided in the previous prompt, but now it seems like you went on the conservative side. What changed and what arguments spoke to you most? To my knowledge, the American Psychological Association still categorizes gender dysphoria as a mental illness. So just to stay on the side of facts, um, and at this time, what the experts are categorizing as, I'm going to obviously side with that side. I feel like science is always changing its definitions, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we yeah. used to drill heads and sides to fix migraines. Um, I'm curious if that will change your mind if that classification was taken away. Well, to my knowledge, I think the American Psychological Association does intend to uh, later categorize it under neurodivergence rather than mental like illness, but it's also something that needs to be treated. When people with gender dysphoria go in to um, get the diagnosis, they do have to go to a psychologist and get um, a prescription and this sort of stuff, so it's part of the process. So just, I understand that science is constantly an evolving field of study, but as to what we know now, I think I'd rather just stay safe and stay with them. I love her demeanor, by the way. She's great. She's just like solid, steady, calm. She's just saying what she thinks and, and going about it, and that and that's great. It's interesting that like the words are switching, and mental illness will be you know mental condition, then it will be neurodivergence. But if you just look into like the root of the words, <laughs> is we're saying the exact same thing: mental disorder versus neurodivergence. It means the same thing. It might sound prettier and sound like, you know, a less stigmatized version of what we were, you know, once once looking at, you know, just like saying mental illness sounds a lot better than saying that person's nuts, you know? So words are gonna change over time and I'm sure they will soften uh, with the current culture that we're in right now, but neurodivergence is, is just a, a pretty way of saying mental disorder. And I'm just going to chime in here. Yeah. I, can, I can sympathize with her desire to want to like sort of defer to the experts and look at what the American Psychological Association, for example, has said. But to your point uh, earlier, we do have other associations in other countries that have banned these practices. And so to just look at one is not really looking at the full picture, mm -hmm. especially when you consider factors like the potential for ideological capture. And there's plenty of evidence of that if you go digging for it and also coming off the heels of this uh, global pandemic and remember the science and how many dubious things and nonsensical <laughs> yeah. things they had us do over the last few years. There's, there's reason to be skeptical of the establishment. That doesn't mean that we should have no regard for the experts and, and research and expertise, but a healthy skepticism is warranted uh, in an issue like this, where there's ambiguity between our associations and other associations internationally. And just given the fact of the world that we live in today, it's it's difficult to, to just trust the experts blindly. It is. Yeah. And it's going to be, you know, more and more so. Obviously, they have special interest as well, which that's a prompt they are going to ask them. I think we are going to skip that prompt, though, because it seems 
seems like they are pretty congruent on that one uh, where they talk about the different, uh, you know, financial benefits from pushing people down this path and why these organizations may be invested in, you know, the research moving in a certain direction. But you all you all know about that. What, what the facts say. Do you feel like if they are to medically transition that they need to go through a series or rounds of different psychiatric tests? Well, in the, in, um, in the case of children, I think that would be necessary just because this is, I know in some cases it can be reversible, but this is a life-changing decision. So you brought up the word life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any question that you'd like to ask either side because that seems to be the big stipulation in this kind of debate here. Um, well, I guess I would like to ask the liberals, did you see in your own lives, like vast improvements, like what did that look like, the vast improvements that you saw? Uh, my mental health was just largely improved. I was having a much easier time, I guess, making friends because I was more confident in my own identity. My children's lives changed completely. It was like turning on a light switch. They brightened, they were more social, they uh, excelled in school again after failing. Um, they just completely transformed their lives. Yeah, I mean, kids will brighten too if they want to wear an Elsa costume to school every day and you allow them to do that and you call them Princess Elsa, you know, like it's it's gonna happen. Kids have certain standards and things that they want, right, that might not be based in reality. And of course, if you meet that standard for them as they are children, it's going to be very easy to make them happy. Kids after Halloween want to eat their whole bucket of candy that night. And you can go, you know what? he's been so depressed lately. I'm gonna let him eat the whole bucket of candy because he's gonna be so happy, you know, sitting on the floor throwing chocolate in his face. And yeah, you're gonna get instant results right then and there because the kid is getting what, they're, what they want. But is that good for them? Is that healthy? And I have a, such a big bone to pick with like Western medicine in general, but I have a feeling that like almost none of these practitioners are looking at the lifestyles of these children and saying, you know what, before we even talk, about whether you're a boy who thinks you're a girl or a girl who thinks you're a boy, what's your diet like? Uh, you know, how much physical fitness are you in engaging in every single day? What's your activity level? How much of a regimen and routine do you have at home? How active are your parents with you in your life? What is school life looking like? And let's get all of those to certain How much metrics. time are you on TikTok? Yeah, yeah. How much time are you on social media? Is, are mommy and daddy giving you a tablet at night while you're going to sleep? How much are you sleeping? How healthy is your sleep? We know all of these things have direct effects on mental health, how good you feel about your body, how good you feel about yourself in congruence that you could feel and every single doctor should get those children on a path to success with lifestyle and then check back in with them and say are you still feeling that incongruence and if they are maybe there's something else to to explore but i can almost guarantee you especially in america with how you know obese people are how satiated they are by social media how little physical activity that they get on a daily basis how little they are sitting with their family and just like talking about their day having real conversations with other human beings of course we are like sick to the furthest degree that you can be sick as a nation collectively almost everybody is carrying around some sort of illness with them and if we don't think that is seeping down into our children here's the here's the evidence because look at the rates of them identifying with this stuff so every doctor should say you have to fix all of these things before i even question whether or not we should talk about gender transition or calling you by different pronouns okay that's very interesting you were on the conservative side, and now you're back on the other side. You guys flip-flopped here. What's something that kind of brought you back into the middle here? Yeah, I would say, I guess, my main reason for being here is that I just am unclear as to, like, I guess the difference between something being a mental illness or mental condition. I, I know some people in the conversation said that they use them interchangeably. Some people said that they prefer to use the term mental condition rather than illness. Um, you know, I guess what kind of differentiates those things, if anything? Well, I think you mm -hmm. just hit the nail on the head there. Changing the name of something doesn't doesn't change the fundamental reality that it, it, there's a there's a problem, there's a mental health issue that the person has. Mm -hmm. It's a disorder. It's a it's a break from reality. That's just a fact. The person is born male or female and thinks that they should be something else. Now, regardless of how that one treats that, the fact is, and I, I would submit even from the, the comments from the liberal side, they recognize that it's an illness that needs to be treated. I recognize mm -hmm. that it needs treating, but it's not a break from reality. That's yes, a psychosis. A psychosis is a break from reality. Exactly. A psychosis is a break from reality. Which is a mental illness. Gender dysphoria is not a psychosis. But it is a break from reality because the person thinks they should be something else. I 
think it's pretty clear. It's a disconnect between reality. You've, you're born male, you're born female, but then your brain is saying something else. The cool thing about this entire debate is that liberals for once agree that there's possibly a soul, right? They say, you know, I was born male or female, but something deep down, something in me is oh, I'm gosh. actually this, I'm actually this. <laughs> that- reality is what is physical. And so if you are physically or biologically male or female, you don't need to change your body, you need to change what you're thinking. Okay, let's go back to... Okay. It's just semantics at this point. But the, the bottom line is, if there was no issue, you wouldn't be seeking treatment, right? If you're a totally healthy, normal human being, uh, for the most part, you're not going to see uh, medical practitioners, really, whatsoever, outside of, you know, yearly checkup, make sure everything's working good and everything's in order. Yeah, that's fine, but we're not on treatment. We're not on prescriptions. We're not, you know, seeing specialists and getting surgeries and things when our bodies are, are healthy and functioning well, it's really as simple as that. And you can call it a mental condition, a mental illness, a neurodivergence, whatever it is, you're going to get treatment for that, baby girl. So that's that's the end of the day. The undecided. Yeah. Did that help clarify or is there any additional questions that I bring up? Um, I guess it kind of did. I, you know, when I think of like a mental illness, it is something that like we treat. And so I guess in that regard, I would, I don't know if it's necessarily a position. I mean, I feel like you know, we do talk about, you know, people who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria, like you treat that with some, I think in many cases, I don't know if it's all the time, I'm sure it's not all the time, but in the majority of the cases, you treat that with some kind of transition, whether it's a medical or a social or both. And so, I mean, I see kind of that definition. I feel like, but I mean, my takeaway is that I feel like they both kind of agree with that. And I don't know necessarily that, I think it's a politically charged definition. I think it's like obviously how you interpret it and like what is treatment, what is proper treatment, you know, what is included within a mental illness, what isn't. But I guess my takeaway I think is like, I think we, or at least the conversation, the people in the conversation, I think they agree a lot more on kind of the general topic itself than maybe they might realize. Um, But of course, when you get to nitty gritty, I think there's, that's where you get the division. The medical community. Okay, we're going to skip this prompt about financial gain uh, just because this video is long as hell. Okay, let's see. Schools should include a trans conversation in sex ed. Okay. Schools should include trans conversation in sex ed. An age appropriate time, I agree, yes. What is that age appropriate? I think by grades three or four, they understand. So what is that, like around eight, nine, or? I don't know anymore, (laughs) my kids are too old. But that sounds about right. I think eight or nine years old is a good time because gender is a concept that is formed in the mind of a child around the ages of two, three, or four years old. By the time they're seven or eight, they understand the permanency of gender. So I think that's a good time to introduce it. Now, should they be talked about as just as much as, let's say, heterosexual sex? or? Sh- it's interesting that she says, like, the permanency of, of gender, when she would argue that gender isn't permanent. She would argue that gender and sex are two different things and that gender can be, like, you know explored and you know has some sort of fluidity to it i so i'm curious what she means i don't know if she means like the societal permanence of of gender based on her own worldview which is why the splitting of like gender and sex and how they now have two different meanings i am just completely uh, i completely disagree with it's really just sex at the end of the day uh and of course i don't agree with schools having this conversation with kids it's not what schools are for at the end of the day. They're not there to tell you about, you know, the different gender identities and how you can show up in the world and wearing dresses versus pants and all this stuff. It's just simply not what school is for. And our students are failing. They can't read, they can't write, they can't do math. Yet we're having conversations about, you know, bottom and top surgery and all this different stuff that has nothing to do with their education. The school system is not a catch-all for like political conversations and our own agenda. It is purely supposed to be for education and making sure that kids have a place to go, that when they leave, they at least have the critical thinking skills and the knowledge to, you know, do something as adults. Uh, And unfortunately, now school is for something totally different and we're getting so much agenda. It's very unfortunate more in in terms of including different historical relevancy, anything like that? I think it would be great to introduce the difference between gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation, because that is three completely different realms, and children can understand the difference between gender expression and gender identity at that age without ever having to talk about sex. Nope. Yeah, I definitely (laughs) disagree. Um, I think especially what they're proposing right now, a lot of the mainstream sort of 
education on sex ed is pretty like vulgar. You're looking at a couple like books, you see a lot of parents going out to like city committee meetings and they're reading books in front of like the school committee and the school has to like stop the the, in, the entire thing because they're reading such vulgar stuff. So if I had to push back on that yeah. though, kind of we've been going through like different personal experiences and some of these cases we might just be hearing about because they're the most extremist of cases. Sure. Do you think that's what's going on or do you think it's more of a common prevalent uh, instance that's happening around the country? Um, I I mean, yeah, I mean, there's there's a differentiation between personal experiences and just what's going on in general. And so, of course, you're going to see like the more popular cases on social media and stuff. But what it really boils down to, the question isn't really so much what's the content, but is it true? And it's not true. And so why there you go. Yeah. Uh, is do we agree that gender identity is even something uh, to be mm -hmm. discussed or is even a valid, uh, you know, science or metric by which we live our lives? And if the answer is no, or if there's any sort of, I don't know, like 20, 80 split, 70, 30, whatever it is then no, why are we having this discussion in school? We can talk about history and in science and, and math because for the most part, these are things that if you completely wiped the brains of human beings, right? If we all got that men in black memory eraser today, we would come to nearly the same conclusion, probably given you know X amount of time to do so with science and math and history and writing and all this different stuff. Uh, these are facts and you know things that are for the most part objective that we would stumble upon again in our human existence would gender identity be one of those things would uh, identifying as trans and getting top and bottom surgery and medical transition and all this other stuff be one of those things probably not so why in the hell would our students be spending any time on that if i send my kid to school which i don't even know if i will do at this point with everything that's going on but let's just say i do that and they come back and tell me they're having conversations about this in school. They're out the next day. They're out the next day. I'd be like, um, we can homeschool you. And sure, my kid will grow to know about what, what transness is and, you know, have their own opinions on that. But that is not what your schooling time is for in any, like, reasonable society. Why should kids be learning about it? I mean, personally, I think that sex education should be simple biology, and then anything above mm -hmm. that should be an opt-in system to where parents have to opt their children into that, into those, into that learning. I, I really don't think it's the responsibility of teachers to be talking to children about that. Mm -hmm. I think it really boils down to it is a parental's right to issue, and parents make the ultimate decision how their children learn that. Um, I, I disagree only because, like, where I'm from North Carolina, and there was a point where sex ed wasn't being taught, and then there was a point where it was. Was. And when it, they started teaching sex ed, there were children that were coming forward about like being touched inappropriate and things like that because they didn't know that those things were inappropriate parts because they hadn't been taught otherwise. So not teaching children about their bodies, about their sex, about their gender, about their expression, you're limiting them, you're, you're giving people, pedophiles specifically, the opportunity to to prey on them because they don't know any better. Dude, that's such a wild argument. That's such a wild argument, but let's just for the sake of it, it's okay. The argument was if we don't talk about sex education and all this other stuff in school, kids will fall victim to people who wanna like touch them without their consent. You really easily, you know, like package that up and wrap it with a bow by telling kids, nobody should be able to touch you without your consent anywhere. You don't have to get into the anatomy of where people might want to touch you or what that means or how two men engage in intercourse or what it means to have a gender identity and to socially transition. You just say, hey guys, nobody should be touching you uh, when you don't want to be touched and you let me know if that ever happens to you in any way ever. You just raise your hand and let me know that that's happened. That pretty much clears that up and, and sticks to the message. How that what he just said includes all the other stuff that is being discussed here doesn't make sense. You're leaving yeah. them in the dark. I as far as like gender so. is concerned, like being trans, had I learned about what trans was at an early age, I think I had a, would have had a very, a much happier life in general. Yeah. By 21, I was going into transitioning everything like that, but I felt and knew that there was something specifically yeah. different yeah. by the age of like six. six yeah. There's a ton of things that would make us happier had we known about them. You know, uh, let's just give an innocuous example. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's a girl named Maggie who had she learned to like crochet when she was five years old, she would have been much happier and that was like a talent she'd want. Or had she learned about like musical theater in school, that would have been a fun thing and she would have known that that's her passion and something to pursue. You can put X, you know, any X, Y, Z thing in that sentence. Had I learned about X in school, I would have been a happier individual. Does that mean that it is now the obligation of the school and uh, specifically government public funded schools uh, to teach teach you said thing that supposedly would have made you happier based on your anecdotal story? 
No, it's then not the responsibility. In that case, you know, let's just ditch the math, the science, the reading, the writing, all of that stuff, and then just figure out, you know, what makes everybody happy at any given moment, and then we'll just do like a master class on that in school. It's not what school is for. Seven, without even knowing what trans was, and had I been taught that, transitioning later on in life would have been completely different. Yeah, and like I said, at the, I think it was the very first prompt we had. I think almost every transsexual I know had that early experience, right? That's mm -hmm. happy in their transition. So I, I agree in that. I just, I, I really think it is the parentals, it, it's parents' responsibility. The schools are supposed to pick up where the parents fall off. That's the whole point of sending your children to school. No, it's not. No, it's not. I don't know who told you that. <laughs> It's not like, I just imagine like your like principal and all your administrators who like come together to like build curriculum and teachers being like, okay, now we have to think about everything that parents might have missed in conversation with their kids that we need to pick up for the school year. That is not what schools are for. You hand your kid off to school with the knowledge that like, yeah, I know how to read as a parent. I know how to write as a parent. I know how to do all of these other things as a parent. I know how to think critically, but I'm going to go to work right now and I'm going to allow another adult who, you know, is specialized and has some expertise with a certain age group to really facilitate that for me so that, you know, he gets some social time with other kids. He comes out of it the other end, you know, learning and having progressed year by year. I just want to send them off to a healthy environment while I do what I got to do. That's what school is for. It's not to be like, ah, oh, there's some things that I've missed as a parent and some political issues that I haven't discussed with them yet at five years old. I'm going to send them to Mrs. Smith to have that conversation with them and to, you know, draw out all of human anatomy on a board and tell them what goes where when they're having sex with people. It's not what it's for. No, your parents have the right to make the decision <laughs> I, for you. Okay. I, I just want to interject right there, and that is a very U.S. way of thinking, is that parent, parental rights trump everything else, because there's a convention of children's rights worldwide, and the U.S. is the only country who hasn't signed on to it. Whoa, so children whoa. in other countries <laughs> have rights before their parents do. Nobody is saying children don't have rights, okay? What we're saying is, right, we are all individuals, right? Children have rights, parents have rights. Do the rights of the, you know, the government, which, you know, really don't exist, but do, do government rights and like government agendas trump that of parents? Absolutely not, okay? So we defer to the parents in the situations that call into question what we should or should not be teaching children. Does that mean that children don't have rights and representation and that they're not protect a protected class within our country? No, <laughs> but it does mean that if it comes down to it and we're choosing between an agenda that the school gets to pick and what parents get to pick, we're gonna defer to mom and dad who have this child and have the family unit and are for the most part, the people who are going to deal with that child for the rest of their lives. And I think that it should be taught in schools to protect the child, not just so that the parent gets to make all the rules. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the other side of the group. Which side do you guys resonate with more, liberals or conservatives? Let's see. I think we have all undecided here. Uh, let's start with you, um, because this is interesting because you've always been on the liberal side until now. Mm -hmm. What spoke to you that made you undecided in this instance? Well, I would just like to mention that I actually work in childcare and I work with children. Mm. And so um, as much as I think that we should have comprehensive um, sex education, I think that five years old is a bit young. Um, I think maybe middle school age, like 10 to, high school. I don't think that um, parents should have completely all the say, mm -hmm. because if that parent is um, more on one side or the other, then they are going to push their child to do what they want them to do, and that child should be able to make that decision for themselves. Okay, that's, you know, it's totally okay that, you know, parents are gonna have different opinions and families are gonna show up in different ways in the world. Of course, you want kids to get a broad swath of what's out there and you hope that parents, even though they have distinct leanings, allow their child to explore that. But do you get to enforce the exploration of these ideas through public schooling? No. <laughs> Once they are at that age. Maybe both sides actually do accept, you know, the fact that trans individuals exist. However, more of the discrepancy is around the age and what, when it's being introduced. What yes. do you think? I, I think she mentioned around eight or nine. I think that's a good age. I have a little brother who's 11 and when he was around that age, 
he was able to understand that I was queer and that my cousin was trans, and he was able to understand that we were we were different. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say around eight or nine is, is probably fine in my opinion, because that's generally the age in which children have a solid grasp on their own identity. And um, it's usually, you know, about 10 years. Where are we getting, like, where are we getting the line here? This is the question. Like, where, who's identifying this line at, like, eight or nine that people understand themselves? Where did we get that from? I just don't know where that came from. <laughs> what? <laughs> figure that out. And I think we're going to get into similar debates here. Like a big question for me whenever we're talking about should minors transition is that the line for minor is different all around the world. Like some people are uh, leave their their minor status when they're 15 in some countries, 16 in, in the UK for the most part, 18 in the US and 21 for different things. So it's a very hard line to draw as far as development outside of, of minor status. And that's a conversation I'm totally willing to explore and to talk about because in that case, in the UK, you would say that 16 is, you know, out of minor status. Maybe that's when they should be uh, able to have conversations about transitioning, whereas, whereas in the US, it would be 18. If we can't def define that line in any other, you know, stage, how is it that they're doing it and saying that eight and nine year olds have an understanding of, of who they are? The only one metric that I can think of now that would make sense is that whole, you know, prefrontal cortex at 25 type thing. And then you would just like across the board, you know, smack dab 25 for for everybody. But even then, you know, females develop at a different pace than men do. And, you know, they have different, you know, things that they can grasp before men can and all these other things. It's a very hard thing to decide, which is why erring on the side of caution and saying minors should not be able to make these decisions is probably for the best, you know, both from an emotional standpoint of wanting to do the right thing, but also a factual one. After that, maybe that they on average will disclose that, but at that age is when kids will usually figure out that they're not cis, if that's the case. Um, this lady, she started, they started with this concept of permanency. I just thought that was so profound, undergirding the point that I've been making from the outset that sex, if you want to call it gender, is there's a permanency about it that needs to be respected. And when you're teaching little kids about transgenderism, you're automatically injecting confusion. Mm -hmm. That feeds to the very contagion that we were talking about at the outset. It breeds this confusion into children. Um, that's a real problem. I agree with the point that was made here. Um, I don't think that sex should really be pushed onto kids at all. I mean, for hundreds of years, public education didn't teach sex ed. And, Things went pretty well. You didn't have all this confusion. And regarding the situation about pedophilia or otherwise, you don't need to teach a children about children about transgenderism for them to know that somebody shouldn't be touching your private parts. Did that help clarify your point? Um, you know, I, did. I think, you know, my takeaway. Yeah, I don't know why they were laughing so hard. I mean, everything that he said was like uh, totally fine. I think they could make an argument for, you know, uh, teen pregnancy and and something along that lines for, you know, sex education. But even then, I don't know that the, the change has been that substantial. Uh, but, yeah, I don't, nothing that and, he said was laughable. And they're kind of having two separate arguments at once. I mean, the, the, the pro, we should educate kids about trans issues. People are saying we should do that at eight or nine years old, presumably because that's when they know their permanent identity and that's before puberty sets in so that they can put a pause on puberty and uh, get them on the gender affirming care path. But the other issue is about sex ed generally when should we teach that and like i don't know about you but when i was in school it was not until like middle school probably like six sixth grade maybe uh which is what you're 11 12 years old at that point and that was just the pure anatomy biology stuff mm -hmm. um so it's interesting that the people who want to teach the ideo ideological components that are pseudoscientific and not scientific want to start even earlier um, but both of those uh discussions are happening at the same time and they're getting conflated yeah it's it they're they've managed to just like mix all of these things in uh, to m support the idea that teaching, you know, transness is something that also needs to be pushed with it. And that's the issue with packaging all these things together. I mean, you should never package all these things together. They're very much separate issues. Sex education is far different than uh, teaching about gender identity. And it's far different than teaching about uh, different sexualities that you can, you know, uh, identify with. And we've managed to package them all together because, Really, it benefits their side to do that, to just say, oh, it all comes together. And if you agree with this, then you agree with, you know, X, Y and Z along with that.
guess, you know, I would say I still kind of am unsure where I would stand specifically, like in terms of age ranges and, you know, content. But I think, you know, for me, I think there is kind of, for me at the center of it, is that conflict between, you know, parents that don't want specific things to be talked about and then parents who just don't care at all. But at least knowing that the conversation's going on and maybe signing off on that. I know we've seen that in the past with, you know, like taking the slips home and being, you know, showing the parent if they, you know, like, we're going to take the kids into classes today. We're going to talk about this. You know, sign off if you want them to or not. However, wouldn't that kind of introduce a bit, introduce a bit of a slippery slope? What if that happens when it comes to discussions around history, around race? Do you think that could lead to parents kind of essentially shaping the worldview that may not be factually accurate? Again, erase everybody's mind uh, and then have humans do research about history. They're pretty much going to come to a very similar standpoint to everything that we've gathered so far. Erase everybody's mind and then go have a gender identity conversation. Things are going to be far different. So it's not just a free for all where you can just opt out of anything and everything that kids are being taught. And even if it was, that's your right as a parent, you know? Uh, and for the most part, if you heard that your kid was being taught something and you didn't want them to go over that, you could just keep them away from school that day if you wanted to. Doesn't even need to be an opt-in or opt-out uh, system. That's just a capability that parents have. And if we naturally have that capability, why not facilitate that when it comes to more incendiary conversations like that of transgenderism and gender identity? Because we've always had that right. It's weird to like encroach on it now. Yeah, it's strange to me that the it seems to be lost on these people that parents should have a say in school, uh, in public, in w the educational curriculum that's happening in public schools and what their children are taught. Uh, the the reality is it's like that because we live in a bottom up democratic republic uh, representative democracy country. We don't live in a top down country that's authoritarian that uh, comes from a central command that tells you what what will be learned. And it seems like some of these people would rather have their kids go to school in China than be able to have a chance to have their views represented in their educational system. And like that, that they're, they're impugning uh, our, what it is to be an American and seemingly wanting to be somewhere else. I don't, I, I don't understand. Like these are literally the rights that you enjoy as an American because you get to shape how you're governed in your country. That's why you have uh, a, a say in what's happening in public schools and mm -hmm. to, to, hate on that or to wish that it were some other way that it, it gives me very bad energy. Yeah. And it's just statistically, it doesn't even make sense to have a conversation about transgenderism in school. If you're in a class of, let's say, 25 students, what are the odds that even one of those students is trans based on the numbers we've had so far before the social contagion? Right. Not high whatsoever. So why would we be spending precious time that you have as an educator with students to teach them things that they will use forever later on in their life to talk about people who identify as a different gender than the one that they were apparently assigned at birth. It just doesn't make sense to be a point of conversation. You know, when you start talking about, I guess, you know, teaching about like sex ed and let's say gender expression, sexual orientation, I think you do walk a different line between like, you know, bringing up points of history or, you know, even like the sciences. I mean, everything, you know, what you include in a curriculum, whether it's science, factual, even mathematics, like there's some kind of, you know, political basis there, whether it's super political or super apolitical. I mean, there's always going to be interest there. And so I think what's really important is, you know, curriculum transparency with parents. I think parents and students should be involved in the development of that process so that everyone at least has a say or at least can see what's being talked about at the table. You really have bounced around everywhere. So I'm curious if you wanted to ask like any specific things. Or Part of my issue, I think, with the idea of like having it mandatory at certain ages um, is that some kids, and this is why I do think parents should have the right to pull their kids out, because I think some parents are, like the really involved parents do know what their kids are ready for and what they aren't. Some kids are not quite ready for those conversations. I think one thing that I heard that was a little concerning to me on the liberal side and kind of kept me here was I did hear someone, I think, say something about a parents of other cultures not being willing to, and I, I, I've lived in five countries. Mm. I've lived in two Muslim majority countries. I've lived in a Hindu, technically should be secular, but Hindu majority country. And I've lived in a Catholic country. And I think the Western mindset and how we approach issues, and we have to understand like, when you're coming out of the country and you're bringing your children into a new culture as an immigrant, you wanna keep your values at home, right? And, and there's things that you're gonna be concerned about and nervous about partially because of like religious affiliation maybe, or just not experiencing it. And so if schools want those conversations to happen, the focus needs to not be going directly to the children but it needs to be going to the parents. It needs to be prioritizing, assimilating the parents in the culture so they are aware how to have the conversations with their kids at home. Because what ultimately happens is if the child is learning something at school and they feel like they can't go home to their parents 
and the parents find out about it in a way that's not, you know, congruent or whatever, this creates a, like a distrust from those parents with the school system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, that, that just brings chaos to America. That's, that's a very serious issue. Do you think this is a... She makes fantastic points. She's so eloquent. My goodness. I wonder how old mm -hmm. she is, because I'm like, these two look like teenagers, but she talks like she's 25. Like... Uniquely American problem. I think it's a Western viewpoint problem. Minors are capable of making life-altering decisions. Yeah, absolutely disagree. There's no way. Uh, minors aren't able to make decisions whether to join the military, uh, get married, or make tattoos. And so when you're talking about something that's super important, like uh, sex, gender, whatever you want to call it, um, there's no reason we should be chopping up kids, putting a bunch of hormones in them that are super dangerous that we don't, have, we don't quite know the effects of, and then completely changing the life. That's what I'm like really passionate about, especially just I think this is like the voice, just this is the sentiment among like a lot of Americans is you can do what you want, but why mess with the kids? And so that's where kind of I'm at. It's like, why mess with the kids? For the purposes of this discussion, we're defining minors as under 18. When you say that we don't know the effects of these chemicals and these drugs and all that, it's worth mentioning that generally speaking, all these medicines that are used were first introduced to be used to treat cis people for various things. Um, Joe Rogan, for example, takes TRT, very similar drug to what trans men take. Um, estradiol is used to treat menopause sometimes. There are people who take uh, spironolactone, which is some taken by trans femmes. People take that the same drug to treat blood pressure. Yeah, but when we're talking- sure. So that's very different. So like Joe Rogan, a biological man taking TRT uh, is very different than a biological woman taking TRT. The same thing with estradiol. It's very different to give that to a woman who's experiencing menopause than it is to give that to you know a biological man. Not to mention that these things are coming in the form of, of a cocktail for you know somebody who's typically not taking them you know it's it's very very different when used for treatment of a whole different medical affliction talking about minors specifically um it's an issue because i don't i don't think that they have the cognitive ability to consent to long-term decisions especially when we start to see like we talked about we can talk about studies like studies show that 90 percent wound up desisting by the age of 20. we know what puberty blocker like puberty blockers for example what they do for precocious puberty but they've never been studied and they're not fda approved they're prescribed off label for for people in key growth years and adolescence and so we're starting to see even marcy bowers talked about starting somebody on puberty blockers and then going straight to cross-sex hormones and every time they're never able to fully just, you know achieve orgasm as an adult every single person that she's ever had and she's the president of WPATH. You have to do the studies you have to figure out and you have to put a pause button on it otherwise what we're doing is literally experimenting on children. So one thing that's also important to consider too is that currently there are laws right when it comes to voting uh, you know drinking alcohol even buying cigarettes at this point, right? I think that is something to consider in terms of this debate. We don't hold someone's hand when we go in to vote. We go in and vote on our own. When a child who is 16 makes a medical decision to transition, it is made with a team. There's parents, there's psychologists, there's endocrinologists. It's not just one child walking in all by themselves to do it by themselves. And we trust children to prepare our food for us at fast food restaurants. We trust children to drive combines on farmland in all 50 states. Why can't we trust a child to tell us Ooh. that they are not comfortable and that we need to treat them medically with a medical transition? Okay, so you can definitely trust somebody to tell you that they're uncomfortable, right? And we do give, you know, teenagers a certain uh, degree of, of freedom, responsibility, and she mentioned different jobs that they can do. Those things are reversible though, right? Like <laughs> that, those are things that you can go, ah, uh, you know, I don't want to flip patties at McDonald's anymore. You know, it's not good for me. I don't feel good doing this. And then you can quit the job and uh, go about your business. The same thing for, you know, using a combine on a farm, I think was the example that she gave. It's far different when you've got a double mastectomy and a bottom surgery and you go, ah, this wasn't the right decision for me uh, now. And even though those adults guided you through that decision and held your hand in the, you know, the operating, you know, room or the waiting room before you got your operation. Are they the ones that have to grapple with the fact that you've now made an irreversible decision? No. So yeah, adults guide you down the path of this life altering choice that you've made, but they're not there to deal with the repercussions. So a minor who is not fully capable of making those decisions, which we, we know that to be true because we don't allow them to make other decisions, should not be allowed to inflict irreversible damage on their body.
Now there's conversations to be had about like socially transitioning, if that's something that a minor wants to do, and you'd hope that you would go through extensive, extensive medical treatment as far as, you know, therapy, a psychologist, having these sort of conversations before you decide to do that. But that's one thing, because that can be, you know, moved around and changed and reversed. This other stuff can't. So the the whole they can get a job thing is not quite not quite doing it for me. No, if you, those, if you work at a restaurant and that goes badly and you get fired or you feel like you can quit or if you get fired, maybe you learn a good life lesson. If uh, right. you make this lifelong medical transition decision, uh, you can't you can't reverse that or you can't reverse large parts of it. So the, it's such a false equivalence there. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, strange, a strange argument. Those are practices. Those are jobs that, that aren't going to affect their lives forever. So that's not even, I mean, you, that, that comparison just isn't going to work at all. You that's can the have first a thing. farm accident. Getting back to the, getting back to this. You can have a farm accident. <laughs> oh, gosh. Like, let's, uh, do we even need to, like, pull up the stats on that happening and compare that to just the horrendous outcomes of allowing minors to transition? No, we don't. It's Main okay. question. Children cannot commit to these life-altering decisions. They don't even know what life they can have. There are so many options that are available available to them and they get cut short. You're making statements about how they have all these adults guiding them into this. That's the whole point. They're guiding them into getting their bodies mutilated when they should be dealing with the mental health issues. Wallace Wong is an unscrupulous medical professional. Pause, I'm gonna just uh, interject here. Imagine getting like a group of, uh, they're saying like eight to nine year olds, right? That was what the liberal side for the most part decided uh, was a good age to talk about this. Imagine you're sitting in a room full of, you know, eight to nine year olds having a conversation about like anatomy and motherhood and birth and all that stuff. Imagine how eight to nine year olds react about those conversations. Have you ever had a conversation with like, you know, any group of kids about anything sort of like serious or like weird about the human body and they're like, ew, gross, oh my gosh, breastfeeding, pregnancy, the baby comes out of where? That's what eight and nine year olds are thinking. Okay, so if that's their mindset for the most part on these things, do you think they understand the full weight of lopping off their breasts and not being able to breastfeed their children in the future? Not being able to have, you know, the skin to skin contact of their, their future child when they inevitably, you know, want to become a mother down the line? Do, they, do you think they understand the weight of letting go of their body's capability to, to become pregnant? Or for men, the capability to get somebody pregnant and to pass on your genetics to to someone else do you think eight and nine year olds understand the weight of that when typically their reaction is ew gross that's where babies come from of course not so you're gonna allow those same children to be on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones and eventually medically transition it blows my mind in British Columbia, and he is part of the whole profit regime, they are rushing kids into these procedures. I know this because a father found out that his daughter was being transitioned with his knowledge or, without knowledge or permission. And when he was telling the public about it, he went to jail. That's what Canada does. So it's not just about big pharma making big money. It's about taking advantage of children that have serious problems. I'm making a personal story here. I hope you're listening. Okay, <laughs> this is like, this is horrendous stuff. These children are confused. They have mental health issues and they shouldn't be still I want to be very clear about that. But the answer isn't to put them under the knife or put chemicals into them that will alter them permanently. I don't necessarily believe that anybody's pushing anybody to be trans. Like when mm. you're like, leave the kids alone, it's like, look at how you talk about trans people who would want to be trans in that sense. Like who would want to be pushing somebody into that lifestyle to it be trans. It is treated. happening. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I'm passionate about it. I'm sorry. How many I, friends I've had who've been mutilated? Hey, 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 hey. Just because you. you got to calm down, Arthur. I not have been able down. to make that at that age doesn't mean everybody that's 16 or 17 can't make that choice at that age. There's so many 16 and 17 year olds who have been emancipated, who have been, you know, oh, you not go. emancipated, but when they take care of themselves legally and like their own, their, their own legal guardian, at that age, they're making that specific decision that I'm old enough and mature enough to make this decision for myself and my life. Like, just because you couldn't do it doesn't mean somebody else can't. There are exceptions to every rule. It doesn't mean that that's the, the blanket we need to put over all of our society. Plenty of 16 year olds are placed into, you know, less than ideal situations where they are emancipated or they have to make their own decisions or live on their own or do these things. That doesn't mean that all 16 year olds should have the capability to do those things or that we should, you know, enforce some new society societal standard that 16 year olds are now capable of making life altering decisions because this one 
uh, was, you know, traumatized in a way that they now have to. Yeah, I, I just I, to, to disagree. Just the laws disagree with that, right? So we have laws against again against marriage, joining the military, um, alcohol, drugs, all these sorts of different. But things. that has nothing to do with yeah, them as let's, people. Let's, let's, yeah, but overall, um, yeah, there are laws against these things, and so we're talking about people. We're talking about a group of people who believe in Santa, right? You're seeing you're seeing younger and younger people get uh, transitioned, right? You're talking about people with this tenuous tenuous grip on reality. There's no reason we should be pushing sex. When I was 13, 14, I was thinking about. Uh, my friends, video games, sports. Let's uh, go to the undecided. Which side do you guys resonate with most? Okay. So I actually want to pick up right where we left off. How old are you? 17. Have you gone through different She's phases? 17? Throughout Dude, that's the craziest thing I've heard this entire episode, that this girl is 17. That's wild. She's going to be, oh my gosh, she's going to be a, a force to reckon with. Are you kidding me? Wow. That's the craziest uh, age surprise I've ever had after hearing someone talk since I heard you talk for the first time. <laughs> I'm like, never mind. Let the minors transition. This girl's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's crazy. Crazy. 17. That's amazing. Good for her. Throughout your life. When I was three and four, I really wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be a singer. Um, when I was six to seven, I wanted to rule the world, actually, quite literally. Um, I, thought I, I thought I'd do a great job. I thought I knew everything. Um, one thing I really wanted to do, and I was really into this idea, was building islands and taking all my friends and family there, and like we could have our own little community type of thing. Um, and then when I was basically like 12, I think 13 maybe, basically up to 15, I was really into the idea of becoming an endocrinologist because of mm. the awesome endocrinologist I had. And then when I was 16, so this would have been last year, um, kind of realized after failing chemistry that maybe medicine was not for me. So um, I took a government class that I loved and I've always had a love of politics and that sort of stuff. So now I'm kind of focused on getting into international relations and politics. Well, I mean, at least you're doing the famous part well right now. <laughs> um, so you went through different, you know, four to five different stages, but you're kind of like on the liberal side at the moment. Can you explain why you decided to step on this stage? There are certain age groups that probably should not be making life altering decisions like three to four year olds. Absolutely not. But it does. Ultimately, I do think parents do need to be involved with mm -hmm. that just because parents do oftentimes have their best children, their children's best interests at heart, even if at times to the public or to the child, it seems unfair. So. I agree, but maybe just a little less with the conservative side this time. People also have said that you don't even develop your prefrontal cortex until you're 25. You know, I'm 26 and I feel like I can probably resonate <laughs> with that. I think the conservative side kept bringing up how there's certain things that you can't do, like in certain age groups. I think they're talking about like um, joining the military, uh, drinking, but in Europe you can drink at 16. Um, in the US you can drive at 16, but in other countries, Middle Eastern and European, you can't drive till 18. So how do we determine, like, in actuality, what the limits are? Do you... Yep, I mean, that's a great question because it's going to be different depending on, on where you are geographically. So I think, like, at the end of the day, it's just going to be about outcomes. So, unfortunately, it's like, it's like the same thing. How do you determine if it's a trend? You're going to have to wait for the outcomes. How do you determine how this is going to end for people who make this decision at uh, an early age? It's gonna be about outcomes, and you can try your best in the meantime to stop being stop people from being able to do those things. Uh, but what happens when you do that to people? They want to do it even harder, and then it becomes a big battle back and forth, and you're playing tug of war, and then you know people fall through the cracks. They make the decision. You're gonna have to check back in on those kids uh, who are you know 16 now, getting double mastectomies when they're 26, and see where they've ended up with every single like major political battle that we've gone through throughout the history of time there is an element of having to allow people to make the mistake. Because if you do not allow them to make the mistake, uh, they will never recognize that it was one. So in actuality with these conversations about transitioning children and all these things, there must be a certain allowance of kids that actually make this decision for us to have any evidence as to how negative the decision is after it's been made. So that's the really unfortunate part of it. The fact that we've even entertained this as a society means that there are certain kids who are going to have to suffer the consequences of doing this. Uh, and, and yeah, you cannot, you cannot learn from your mistake if you've never 
made it. So certain group of people are, are going to. There's going to be, I don't know how big that number is going to be. It's already pretty huge right now, but there's going to be one. And real quick, Amla, to your point of uh, just a second ago about like maybe a little bit of overconfidence on the part of youthful people who th- are less concerned about potential negative outcomes because we just don't know, et cetera. Like, I wonder if that maybe colors her perspective a little bit, being a, a minor who has such a firm head on her shoulders and is clearly like a very intelligent person She's who admittedly by her own uh, words had, had said she wanted to take over the world as a five-year-old. And I, <laughs> part of me believes she could, but uh, she's clearly very intelligent, but you got to think like you know extrapolate that to maybe a generation we know that like gen z's identifying with this stuff more but also supporting it more and so is it just sort of a, a youthful naivete that's coming into four here that that is has not yet learned the consequences of uh gender affirming care pushing people down that path uh just simply because it's a new phenomenon it's a new social contagion that's that has emerged and so there's a little bit more of a cavalier attitude where then you have like the boomers like arthur who can kind of see the the negative consequences from a mile away maybe that's some of the aged wisdom who are banging their fists on the table uh and then i guess a lot of us are kind of in between like maybe we should pump the brakes on this uh and look mm-hmm. at the facts but uh it's just interesting how that plays out i think you made a great point yeah you wonder like what are what are the things that when we're old, we're going to be warning like the youngins about and saying, ah, you know, we thought that too when we were, you know, like 16, 20 or whatever. And trust me, we tried that uh, and it didn't work out. And every generation is going to have their thing, right? So at the end of the day, it kind of, it, I don't want to say it becomes an exercise in futility to fight these things because I think it's always a wonderful thing to just debate and, you know, uh, you know, persuade as many people as you can to maybe not make the mistake that you seem to see on the, the horizon. And the conversation alone is worth having. But there is going to be those things that just like every generation cyclically goes through to where 20 years later they're warning, you know, the next one to come. And what that's going to be when, you know, this next generation grows up, I have no idea. A little scared to to see it, but it's normal. Like, I'm sure you guys can think of things, uh, you know, people who are older than me at 23, older than Taylor, drop down like the things that you were doing as, as a teen that you thought were the right thing to do that are no longer the right thing. And you recognize now with a little bit of age and wisdom. Do you guys have any thoughts amongst you, you two of uh, what made you guys go to the conservative side? I'd love to hear a discussion between you two. The one thing that really resonated with me is, is we're talking, I think he said, we're talking about kids who, people who still believe in make-beliefs. I just don't think they understand the gravity of the situation. Maybe not just transitioning, but there's certain decisions that they don't understand the gravity of. I would push back a little. I think, like, especially when it comes to teenagers, I would say, like, 15, 16, I would say high school range. I think, like, we should probably give them a little bit more credit. I think, you know, when it comes to something like that, I mean, I would say, like, I think it's, of course, you know what I mean? We're talking about minor. It's a huge range. But I think we should, in general, give a little bit more credit where it's due to them. I will say the reason I'm here is because I think I just agree fundamentally with the idea, like, making life-altering choices. I don't think... Mm-hmm. You know, anyone under the age of 18, I guess, maybe might be arbitrary, but, you know, in that minor range, as we've defined it in this country, I would agree. I don't think, you know, life altering, whether that's a medical transition or even something like, you know, like what school you go to, like what college. I mean, you know, minors make decisions like that all the time, but they're not most of the time. And I would hope usually they're not, you know, completely on their own. You know, we have support systems. And I think mm-hmm. what's really important is that we extend those support systems to so like counseling and, you know, people at schools and, you know, educating parents so that students aren't going into decisions completely on their own. What is so fascinating and I think is like somebody needs to do just a massive, you know, work up on what are the most like persuasive tactics for a certain group of people because these six people have been sitting across from each other just like spitting studies and facts and W path this and Marsha Bauer says this and the numbers look like this. But what resonated with that girl and got her to stand on the other side was that guy saying kids still believe in Santa and she heard that and went, oh. You know, I believed in Santa at one point. And imagine if I had made a decision like that. And it's so important that we choose our words wisely, dependent on like the demographic of, you know, the people that we're talking to or their their possible background or what we perceive to be the most persuasive thing to say to them. Because out of all the facts that were shared in the back and forth and the real life anecdotes saying kids still believe in Santa was what got her to move over to the other side for at least a moment. Miners should be allowed to medically transition? Absolutely not. 
That has not changed for me. We're talking about mental health issues, and there are a whole host of problems that children deal with when they're struggling with identity or gender dysphoria. Let's treat those issues. Let's treat those causes. I have mentioned numerous cases of former, former trans kids who were pushed into it, parents who tried to protect their kids and were punished for doing so. This is a very fraught affair. This, these are irreversible, damaging procedures, and we have so many detransitioners that are coming out warning the next generation not to do this. I think it's worth mentioning that the detransitioners, while I do sympathize with them and I think it's unfortunate that the medical system has failed them, they're a statistical anomaly in the grand scheme of how many people have transitioned medically and surgically. That's, we don't know that though. So the issue is we don't know what the detransition rate really is simply because they're falling off the rolls. If you don't have your primary sex organs removed, then you can literally stop taking hormones and nobody's following up on them. Also, we also know that the, uh, the longest study out is the five-year study and the average detransition takes place four to 10 years after. And so those people are not being counted in those studies. I think that we should be working on mental health coverage. We should be getting them to an age of, a, age of adulthood. Um, we shouldn't be mutilating them um, as at a young age. And, and, and I think that they, like he said, like your prefrontal cortex is where you make impulse decision making. And so that's what develops last. And so we should be getting them there. I think we can look at social transition. Social transition may not be a zero sum game because we see that it kind of generally leads to transition. But let them socially transition, get them to adulthood, and see where we're at. I agree. Let them socially transition, use hormone blockers, mm -hmm. start mm -hmm. cross hormones at an appropriate age when the body is ready to be receiving cross hormones later on. I also agree that we shouldn't be mutilating children. I don't believe anyone's being <coughs> mutilated. but. Surgery doesn't have to happen before 18 if they are already being treated with cross hormones or hormone blockers. And we can wait until they're 18 if we are helping them and affirming their gender. I don't believe anybody has an agenda of chopping children up. Yeah, I would just say ultimately those who are promoting this and those who are accepting it will be accountable. We're seeing a lot of different lawsuits coming out. Uh, there's a transgender, or detransitioner who is now suing Kaiser Permanente to help in, um, in like San Jose area because she felt like she, um, she, he, I don't even know what gender they are, but um, they felt like they were um, led into this. They were, they were tricked, they were kind of ran into that system and now they're suing. And you're gonna see a lot of rise of these lawsuits. And so just to finish, I would say that um, children are too young to transition. Uh, they can't fully grasp this concept. And then also it's just not true. And so we shouldn't be pushing it for kids. And I think the solution to this is accepting who you actually are, accepting your actual body, going through therapy, and you know, I'm a Christian, seeking the gospel. Letting, let, we're made in God's image and likeness, and so allowing God to speak into that through prayer and sacraments and, yes. I get the argument of, you know, you're not developing until you're 25, but if that's the case, then people shouldn't be experiencing anxiety and so on at 26, if that's gonna be like the main point of argument, like. What? That, you know, I started paying bills and working at 15, 16, and put myself through school. I bought my first car, 16, but my my second car, my third car, all on my own. And I wish somebody at that time had looked at me and told me that I wasn't allowed to be making specific decisions for myself because, you know, I think that's on a person-to-person -person basis, and I completely agree with you that... These things are so different than lopping off your breasts or getting bottom surgery. I just can't, you know, stress that point enough. Getting a car that you can give away uh, you know, sell, you know, you know, move back on is totally different. If they're at that time, they're ready for that, then they're ready for it. And if they're not, they're not. So now let's see the final decision from the undecided group. Okay, let's see where they go. Now undecided, what's your final decision? Conservative, one liberal. So, what's been great about this video is that a lot of you guys have switched different spectrums. So let's start out with what made you go to the liberal side? Um, I think that you made some really good points um, about being able to um, start puberty blockers and socially transition. And like surgeries do not need to happen before 18. They can happen after, but as long as the person can decide to start puberty blockers and decide to socially transition because what if they don't make it to 25? What if 
they're not still alive to transition oh. at 25 when they're fully developed. Gosh, poor, I think she's just been, had the daylights scared out of her by some of the rhetoric surrounding this stuff of like, do you want a trans kid or a dead kid type of thing? Uh, and it seems like she has some personal experience on that with her family. I feel for her. She seems like she has a very good heart. And I do like that she's granted, you know, surgeries can wait till till after 18. There seemed to have been some some movement there there on her part. And she seems like just a very uh, sensitive heartfelt, you know, individual. And I can see how having that disposition would lead you to have this, uh, this thinking. So like, I just don't, um, sorry. And like, I seen my cousin that I mentioned, um, I, I just, I can't imagine my life without them. And if they were not, like, if they're not able to transition, um, I know the effect that will have on their life, and I just, I can't imagine it. I think Unfortunately, she doesn't know the effect that that'll have on their life, and she'll never know the effect that that'll have on her cousin's life. Your cousin could have been, like, you know, free and flourishing in the body that he slash she was born in, and uh, with what's happened now, you'll never get to see what that was. And I don't think people talk enough about being robbed of that as a person who decides to make these decisions. Like, all of the trans people present in this video now, you'll never like truly know what that person was like meant to look like, who they were meant to be, what their personality was meant to be, because it then just becomes this caricature slash act that's full of, you know, like plastic and surgeries and all of this stuff. So you, you're never truly going to get to know what that person was meant to, to turn out like, and that's, it's sad. I think for me, what made me come to the conservative side is I definitely think that social transitioning is acceptable. Um, I think of the case of like Angelina Jolie's um, daughter who went through a long, long phase of, I guess, we are not entirely sure if it was gender dysphoria or not, but wanted to present as male and then came to an age when they did decide that that was something they no longer wanted to do. And so I, I really respect that opinion and I am also concerned about that. I really genuinely, we also, if we're not entirely sure like what the medical you know, transitioning has long-term effects or like the medicine itself on the brain development and all that stuff. I think we should just be very wary of letting children transition, even if it is with um, medical, you know, teams. Because as you said earlier, science is constantly a changing field. I still lean very much towards the middle, but I think if I had to pick, I lean right now a little bit more on the conservative side. And I think, I think the point you made about how we just don't know really like the detransition rate. Transitioning is a process, you know, medical transition, also social transition. And you're absolutely right, you know, in 10 years from now, you know, someone's experience might not be the exact same. I'm not saying that that's the case for everyone. I'm saying that that's probably still not even the majority of people, but I do think it's still a significant amount to, to take into consideration. There's still a lot that maybe we just don't fully understand. And I think until we get to that point, I'll just err on the side of caution. At least that's how I see it. Clearly we all have our okay, own bias. Okay, cool. That was a dope, dope video, dope format. I like the idea of introducing people uh, to this format who are undecided and letting them hear both sides and and getting to hear from them. I think that's super, super cool. Good job, Jubilee. Can I ask you, Amala, like yeah. they, it seems like a couple of them in the end there uh, posited social transitioning. They said like, I'm not comfortable with medical transitioning, but social transitioning, that's uh, the more moderate sort of middle ground. That's uh -huh. okay to start kids on. Uh, do you, I, and when I hear that, I hear that it, I go back to the, the Hispanic guy's point earlier where he said, what matters is, is it true or is it not? And if it's true, it should be taught. If not, then, then no. And I don't, I don't see social transitioning as like a middle ground. There's, there's accepting your child or the child and, and making them uh, free to present themselves in the world how they want to present. But the idea of social transitioning, depending on what you mean to me, says we should just start them with the ideology and allow them to live out this ideology, tell them, yes, you have a gender identity. Yes, this is your gender identity. And then from there, it's it's a very slippery path right into uh, the puberty blockers. And I was just looking at a statistic a minute ago that 98% of kids who are put on puberty blockers continue on to uh, the cross-sex hormones and then who knows uh, the surgery. So to me, I just don't like that, how that, that social transitioning was kind of framed as like this, oh, it's just this happy little compromise. It depends on what you mean by social transitioning, in my opinion. Like, like you said, and like Sarah said in the video, yeah, once you socially transition a kid, it's more than likely they're going to continue to medical transition, whether it's through their, uh, the stage of, of being a minor or as an adult. Now, if you ask me, like, if I had a son and my son goes, hey, mom, I want to like wear a tutu or play with Barbie dolls or, you know, wear, buy a pink shirt or whatever. I'll be like, 
yeah, we can explore that and we can explore your expression, which some deem to be social transitioning, but you are not a girl. <laughs> like, let's make it very right. clear. You can like these things and want to explore them and like glitter and all this stuff. You are not a girl. So uh, they didn't give much clarity on what the two of them meant by the idea of social transitioning. If it is, we socially tell them that they're a girl when they're not, and we allow them to, you know, just like run amok without getting surgery and start all these other things. And I vehemently disagree with that. But if it's, yeah, he can try on, uh, you know, a skirt or my my little girl can wear slacks if she wants to, you know, feel all masculine or whatever, then yeah, that's, that's cool. I think once you give children the space to explore with the set, you know, boundaries of the binary, you are a boy and that's not going to change they have so much more more freedom and it just alleviates, I think, a lot of the the confusion. Yeah, so that's my stance. Yeah, I agree. Time for Super Chats? Time for Super Chats. Let's All do right, it. All right, let's get into them. Uh, we're going to try to get through them relatively quickly. It's been a long stream, but we appreciate you guys sticking around with us. If you yes, haven't liked do. the stream yet, please do so. It helps yes. us out. And subscribe if you haven't while I'm at it. Uh, <laughs> First one today comes from Must Pavlov Dogs, who says, I'm moving in a couple weeks and I've been really stressed, also feeling sick. Can you recommend any music or other media that helps you relax? Ooh, Thanks. Uh, if relax. If, if I'm going to go for like relaxing, I probably do like some old school jazz or some classical music. I feel like maybe something with with no lyrics that it just allows you to, you know, just have a good time, hear something beautiful. That's good. Y'all know me. I like my like musicals and stuff like that. That's sort of the stuff that I listen to, but I don't know that that's a good, a good recommendation. Something that clears the head. I myself am going to be moving in a, a few weeks as well. So I'm with you on that. The whole struggle of like, hitting people up about their apartment, scheduling tours, going to them, checking them out, seeing like who's competing for the same place you're trying to get. It is not fun whatsoever. I hate the process of moving, but I always like view it positively. You're going to be in a cool new space and just got to give a positive spin on what's happening. Here, here. I uh, recently found a playlist on Spotify called Nordic Chill. And it's like, <laughs> viking music with like lo-fi and it's pretty awesome so like the old school like i don't know flutes so and funny. horns and stuff but <laughs> super relaxing puts me to sleep there so there you go advise that uh cupids says sarah spoke about this debate in her new video she said that when they that they edited out a lot of what she said and how eric acted toward everyone huh i don't even remember which one eric is the okay must be the middle trans guy um, okay. yeah, I'm, of course, with all these Jubilee videos, you know, they're heavily edited and that they, there's stuff that they have to scrap for time. I'd be curious to see like a director's cut. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we always talk about how the editors in these videos have so much influence and in, mm -hmm. in how it was discussed, but we, we're familiar with the Jubilee guys. We think they're pretty fair. Yeah, so. they're, they're cool. Uh, Hi Q says, Amala, Dr. Frankenstein created uh, his monster and in the end it destroyed him. Liberals have created their monster and in the end it will destroy them. Yeah, well, I mean, you better, I don't know if I'll say a monster, but what I will say is these things will, it will wreak havoc on all of society. You know, when, when, uh, when part of our community is ill, uh, be it ill-treated or like mentally ill or anything, it will come to to affect all of us. That's why it's within all of our best interest to come to the table, have this conversation, decide what's right, decide what's going to lead to the happiest of individuals because happy people make for good communities. So it will come to affect us all. Uh, must Pavlov Dogs again says weaponizing your group suicide rate won't get you the respect, get your respect or equal treatment. At best, you'll get pity and everyone will treat you as a fragile child. Yeah, it's an unfortunate, you know, sort of sticking point that people use to make their arguments uh, for or against transition. And I don't think it reinforces their argument in the way that they think it does. I can see how it could scare and like fear monger people into making a decision, but it's not, in my opinion, the best way to move forward if they want to sound, you know, reasonable. Where's the love says first time making it to the show live. Thank you for speaking truth in this world full of confusion and lies. Oh. Hope your week has been well. Thank you so much. Yes, it has been. Well, I hope yours has been too. guys rate your weeks. How's your, how's your week been out of 10? Drop it in the, in the chat down below. 
half breed observer says shout out to a fellow half breed i truly <laughs> appreciate your content you served as an inspiration for mine although you're way nicer than me keep it up oh thank you <laughs> i appreciate it half breed that's hilarious yeah it's like calling you a mud blood or something <laughs> uh <laughs> My Ma Mud Saleh uh, just sends a super chat no message. Same Thank thing you. with Vrixi. Thank you. Oh, here's one from Ma Mud. Uh, says just like gender identity dysphoria was normalized uh, w- without any medical study. Same happened with trans. Oh, just how yep. gay was normalized without any nor- without any medical study. Same happened with trans. What's next? Pedo necro. See, it's too I- dangerous. I don't equate the two. I don't equate the two. I think they're they're very different things. Although uh, if you do read Deborah So's work about like homosexuality and transness, you will find that there's a, a lot of similarity there, at least in like in brain scans, which I think speaks more against the trans debate. But I'm not going to get into the weeds on that. I, it's one thing to be, you know, a woman who likes other women or a man who likes other other men. And I, I don't know uh, that I can point to, you know, much harm that that perpetuates on society. I know plenty of gay people, I have plenty of gay friends, and I don't think that that creates a slippery slope towards something, uh, you know, more nefarious in any way, shape, or form. Uh, So it's unfortunate that the two are utilized and grouped together because I don't think they they should be. I think they're wholly separate things, uh, which is why LGBT and putting that in one camp just uh, makes no sense. None. Uh, he also said, may God help us love your show, Amala and Tyler. So, <laughs> Tyler. <laughs> sorry, my life being called Tyler. <laughs> back in the day when we first started the show, it was uh, Travis or mm-hmm. I don't know. It was like the running joke that people Ty called little. me random white guy T names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, House of Has says these people will, ca- will call trans people transphobic later once they start suing these rubber stamping doctors. Yep. You know, you're already seeing it happen. Internalized transphobia is what they have. Uh, Cassandra444 just sends a keep it up emoji. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you. Blair says, do you have any trans friends? We aren't all crazy activists, and some of us are even right wing. I mean, yeah. We've Transitioning had... can help, but it isn't for most people. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not for most people. Uh, we did have Buck Angel on the show, who uh, is a, a transsexual you know, friend and an acquaintance. Uh, tried with Blossom. That didn't end up being a friendship. (laughs) Uh, Savannah Raymer says, around 2005, my dad told me, his eight-year-old girl, that when I was born, the doctor turned my P into a V. I believed him and was horrified, and I struggled with my gender identity in high school. Imagine if that happened today. So he just told you for giggles that that is what happened to you? That's a very strange choice to make. That is strange i guess i could see somebody making that joke in passing outside of the time that we're in right now and it probably wouldn't be as weird as as it is now with everything going on but i can imagine that that is probably not that's something that if you make the joke you should clear it up immediately and say no i'm just kidding because right and that's not clear if he did and if she was still struggling with her gender identity in high school after being told that when you're eight i can't imagine that it was made clear enough to you (laughs) yeah that's pretty messed up either way i'm sorry that seems very traumatic yes it does (laughs) <laughs> glad you're here and hope you're doing okay yes uh house of has says the state and schools are asking for trust to teach about sex while they struggle to get under control teacher uh male and female having teachers are having sex with students they should not they have not earned the trust of parents oh yeah no absolutely they've done nothing to earn your trust whatsoever other than what go get a degree and do a couple years of practice with teaching kids there's there's nothing and that's the thing that uh it's a problem on both ends. I think we as, you know, our citizens have just deferred too often to public education because, oh, it's easy. I can just send my kid to school or whatever. We handed them the trust that they are now abusing and utilizing. So it is like accountability needs to be taken from uh, both sides of the issue. We're the ones who allowed them to, you know, just run amok like this. Uh, Lilith Requiem says... Uh, P.S. We need your nuanced discussion and influence to get out there now more than ever. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Uh, Also, congrats on going solo. Thank you so much. Uh, We try. Nuance nuance discussion is at the the forefront of everything that we we do here, hopefully. 
And I was about to bring this up in reference to the last super chat uh, before this, but Casey's going to make the point for me. It says, what you said about schools is unfortunately true. Oregon announced that they're suspending required fields to graduate. Mm -hmm. They won't need to show basic understanding of reading, writing, math until 2029. Gosh, and you're more and more worried about gender. It's like, okay, no, you're going to have a bunch of adults who can't read, write, or do basic math. And they're the ones who are soon going to be running our country. Or they're just going to be like useful idiots to the people who decide uh, that they can manipulate these people and they'll be the ones who run the country. So it's going to be the corporations and the Bill Gates of the world and all this stuff that's happening right now. There's other things to be way more worried about in our education system than whether or not we're talking about gender identity. 100 percent. Uh, cheesecake bro how's it going hey guys i didn't get to listen to the entire stream but i'm guessing you were talking about arthur earlier amala society let feelings trump facts which is why we are where we are arthur's no. correct no i mean he's correct everything that he's saying is factual uh but how much more useful are facts when you uh you communicate them properly to the people who are there to to listen to them if you have an audience that is for the most part agreed. I'm going to be here to listen to both sides and you've agreed to represent your side. You should represent your side in the most respectful way possible. It's very different if you're up against, you know, a group of people protesting you for what you believe. Then some of Arthur's aggression may or may not be necessary or useful. But when you're in a room of people who are coming to you and saying, hey, I am undecided on this issue and I don't know where to land. And you are that aggressive in the way that you, you know, form your formulate your opinions. It just doesn't work. I mean, we know it doesn't work. I was a former leftist who knows for a fact that especially talking to women in particular and young women in particular, you're not going to get anywhere, you know, being being that aggressive. Yeah, correct it does not equal persuasive. And yes. I, Arthur kind of went back and forth. There were some times where he came across as being more earnest mm -hmm. than uh, just aggressive. But I think he, he got he let the emotion get a little uh, better of him at times. And uh, unfortunately, I think that probably pushed some people away, even if it does feel good to hear someone say something that's like, oh, yeah, they nailed it. They really told them. It's like, right. it does, is it persuading the people who are uh, in limbo and are willing to be persuaded? Uh, Brandon Orr says, yes, sex, sex, sex education is important and children should learn it from a proper and accurate source. Also, why are we adding new curriculum for LGBT when they can't teach heterosexual sex properly? Yeah, there's, there's just no, there's no room for it. There's simply no room, no room, no time. We have other priorities. Uh, take is Sobio, Taki Sobio says, uh, Hi from Poland. I'm not pro our current soon to be passed government, but one thing they got right, they nipped the gender stuff in the bud. Yeah, there you go. If you can get one thing right, hey, that's a good one to get right. Based Poland, I guess. <laughs> uh, Vrisky just sends a super chat, no message. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. Madeline Glidewell says, as a public educator myself, I don't understand the excitement for teaching sex ed. Normal adults aren't com comfortable discussing sexuality with children. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah, If I was weird. a teacher, I'd be like, I hope I don't get the assignment to, to teach the yeah, sex Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not chomping at the bit to have that discussion. And it's because they're ideologically motivated. There's, like, really no other reason, I feel, that you would be that excited to be. But then again, you, you probably want the reluctant ones to be the ones doing it because the ones that are eager to teach them are not the ones that you want exactly. uh, teaching your kids these days. Oh, dear. Uh, Patrick says, regarding the point about children having rights before parents in places like Australia, this regards custody issues between parents, not inappropriate discussions between teachers and students. Wait, what was that? Read the beginning part. Regarding the point about children having rights before parents in places like Australia. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then, sorry, read the second part. <laughs> uh, this regards custody issues between parents, not inappropriate discussions between teachers and students. Right. It seemed to be like a very flippant comment that like all these other countries have agreed that children have rights in, in this, you know, in this certain way. And the U.S. hasn't done it. It's like, I'm pretty sure there was no like massive forum to discuss what children are taught in schools and parental rights. And all these other countries agreed that, uh, you know, children have, you know, specific rights and, and the parents don't. It's just ridiculous. The amount of like tangential points that they were making in order to make what was, you know, a pretty ridiculous argument was was a little wild. Uh, Make Mackey, M-A-K-I, says uh, 13 and love watching your videos for fun. 
Uh, wow. I've had it. I'm surprised of all For the fun, fun things out there to watch. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's intense debates and commentary on awesome. transgender issues. Uh, but I love it. Uh, I've had many LGBT plus phases before and watching people like you and Taylor makes me feel smart. By the way, would you ever be able to do a collab with Brett Cooper? Oh, there it is. Maybe. Maybe one of these days we will. Who knows? Who knows? I think she's a bit busy. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think everybody... This is the thing, like, everybody has, like, thoughts about sexuality and, like, goes back and forth, especially, like, when you're a teenager and you you think certain thoughts and you wonder how valid those thoughts are or how much, you know, reverence you should give to them. And these are normal things. I think we can, you know, destigmatize those conversations. However, it doesn't mean they need to be, you know, happening in, in school and stuff. If you just allow for thought exploration rather than like let's let's explore puberty blockers and hormone replacement therapy and all this different stuff uh i think you'll you'll live in a much more sane society yeah i feel for 13 year olds today when i was 13 i had probably never heard of transgenderism yeah. i had never heard of pronouns or identifying as anything that was completely just literally something i had never heard of or occurred to me right. so i mean back then it was like I don't know. Uh, you had your emo, your goth, your <laughs> jock. I mean, that was the extent of like the identity yeah. <laughs> options available to you. Um, so it's it's tough out there, but mm -hmm. I'm glad glad you found your way to us. Uh, Trenton Nichols says, I know Brett Cooper talked about this, but sometimes homosexuality is rooted in corn. Oh, well, yeah, uh, I, I, would, I think there's a lot of different things that, you know, I don't want to just label it as, as homosexuality is rooted in human sexuality, whether you are yeah. heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, all these different things that you can identify as now. A lot of it is going to be things that were, you know, nurtured into you. Right. So that could be pornography. That could be sexual abuse. It could be what your earliest sexual experiences were as a human being that will lead you down uh, certain paths, certain interests, certain things that you identify with. And to just like throw that all out and say that we're just all, you know, born a certain way and it's not socialized in any way or nurtured in any way, I think is obviously Incorrect. I mean, look at the effect that pornography has had on our society at large, how it's affecting the minds of men and women and how we treat each other and all this stuff. It's it's just insane to me to think that uh, nurture has nothing to do with human sexuality in any way. Again, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, doesn't matter. Uh, Scarlet, the Scarlet Ibis says, I was required to teach my second grade class about how they're the quote unquote boss of their body and should say no touch no to touch in their bathing suit area. Uh, parents could opt out, but should have been a home conversation. Felt uncomfortable. Yeah, it's just that, that it's a it's a very uh, I think it's a very important conversation to have a hundred percent with children of any age. A, a conversation about consent and how people should and should not treat you, and who to go to if somebody treats you incorrectly. I think. Every kid, if we could somehow get that that conversation out there, I think it's an important one to have. It's just about how we how we do it, and yeah, it might be an uncomfortable conversation to have as an adult with kids, as you know, it for the most part very well should be because it's an unfortunate situation, it's an uncomfortable situation to happen to a child, so it's an uncomfortable conversation to entertain in the mind of an adult. Uh, so, yeah, I, it's totally worth having. It's just about the way that you the way that you do it. Sandra Allen says, uh, if trans people of the past were influenced to act against their instinct by what was normalized, then shouldn't it be easy to conceive that the opposite could be true as LGBTQ media becomes popular? Say the beginning part again. Sorry, I keep getting... Uh, if trans people of the past were influenced mm -hmm. to act against their instinct by yes. what was normalized, then shouldn't it be easy to conceive that the opposite should be true as mm -hmm. LGBTQ media becomes popular. 100%, yeah. What is within what the the cultural zeitgeist of the time is going to be uh, what what influences you. If the, Which is a fantastic argument that should have been made, and uh, uh, thank you for that argument. If you say, you know, in the 1950s there was a whole lot of shame socially surrounding transgenderism and nobody came out, then I guess that's, that's influenced people, right? So if we had social media back then, social media probably would have been influencing people down the path of what would they call that? They would call that transphobia. Um, and uh, you'd have a bunch of transphobes running around. So would that have been a trend of the time? Probably, but they will not concede that this is a trend now. Uh, let's see. 
Fourier says, hi, I hold moderate political views. Enjoy your videos despite differing opinions. I questioned my gender at 15. My mom advertised waiting, advised waiting until 18. Mm -hmm. Initially, I was sad, but now I'm grateful she said that since I was wrong. Yeah, and I can I can think of so many things as a, as a child that I thought and your, your mom is like, no. And then you go, oh, you sucker. I hate you. <laughs> like, you don't really love me and all these things. And then you get it like a couple of years into your belt and you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> was dumb that was dumb and that was not something that I should have ever done and you like I think a lot of this too is like parents of this age and maybe like millennial parents and stuff not being reared to be able to have hard conversations and to really like lay down the law or they've had the law laid down on them too much by their parents and they don't want to do that to their kids so it's just like a free-for-all now where they can do whatever they want you have to be able to discern what is good and what is not good for your kid and be able to just lay it down and say, I'm so sorry this is gonna hurt you right now and you're gonna absolutely hate me for saying what I'm about to say, but you're not a boy in a girl's body. That's it. Yeah, no, it was, the point was never raised in this uh, debate, but you know, we know from like, what was it, the, Ken, the work of Ken Zucker, that mm -hmm. if, if kids are not pushed down this path of blind affirmation, uh, the majority of them to the tune of something like 80%, 85% grow out of their gender dysphoria by the time that they're done with puberty. So yeah. uh, that is should not be lost on us in this discussion, yet it appears to be. And almost 20 seconds ago, you, all, you refer to your tattoo as a decision that you should not have been able to make. <sighs> Uh, and yet you've got the uh, yeah, black alas. power fist now. Oh, gosh. Horrible, horrible. Uh, needs to go. Uh, let's see. Jellybean Zero says, many in the community won't speak out if they disagree. They and anybody even talking to them after their kick will be kicked from support networks and even from banned discords. Well, yeah, I mean, that happens. It's like uh, so many people are so ideologically driven that you can't even have the conversation anymore. We do have our own Discord, though. So if you get kicked out of yours, <laughs> you can come to ours and actually you have a discussion. <laughs> yeah, you can sit with us and have a discussion. Don't, don't. If people are willing to kick you out, they don't like you in the first place. So it's like, what's to, there's nothing lost. Yeah, that was a that was a clever uh, segue to to plug the Discord, but very natural. That's I why say? we have it. There's... What can I say? <laughs> Uh, Gigi Harlow says, Amla, as always, thank you for your wisdom sending support from NYC. Oh, that's awesome. My, my brother lives in New York City, so shout out to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rachel Fly says, I'm a preschool teacher. We had a child years ago socially transitioned mm. at three. A child's mind is a sponge. They're very vulnerable. Academic scores are declining rapidly, yet this topic takes priority. Yep, that's that's what happens, and it's just like, okay, uh, like I said, there's other things to be worried about, and if your kid's transitioning, oh my gosh, their soft mind is just going to be pumped full of stuff that is just not healthy for them whatsoever, at all. Yeah, Danny, oh, Danny Lee says, I love the show and have been watching for a long while, but I am wondering how many people remember anything they were doing at four years old. I don't remember anything. Me neither. I have no idea what was going on with four-year-old Amala, but shout out to her. <laughs> uh, Savannah Raymer says he wanted a boy. This is Oh, she was referring to the story with her dad who uh, told her that uh, okay. she, they transitioned her genitals. He wanted a boy, but later tried to convince me I was a lesbian, comma, no. Uh, I went no contact at 14. I wanted to bring awareness about parents who push this stuff. Yeah, um, that's crazy. And yeah. that sounds like there is some other very, very deep issues happening with your father. And I'm sorry that that happened to you because that, that sounds absolutely awful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm glad you found, found uh, a place to be with mm -hmm. us. Um, Sarah G says, hello, I'm 13 too. Love your videos. I've got trans friends and the manipulation to tell confused teenagers is awful. Makes me mad crying emoji. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll check back in and everything will be fine later. Later, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, Lex says, obviously gender dysphoria is real, but I truly believe the push for everyone who has mental health problems to transition is modern day eugenics. Ah, uh, well, I guess you could say in a, in a way, I don't know that they're actually like playing chess like that and they're th really thinking through that far, but uh, it is, you know, it is steriliz sterilization to uh, to some degree. But 
you know, I, I, I don't attribute that to nefarious thinking. I think it's just a side effect of the ideology. Uh, cheesecake bro looks like this is our last one says uh the reason why i think arthur is right is because with the facts that he lays out he sets the liberal side up to hopefully show just how radical they are uh, yeah right is right uh and you know it, it's fine i mean he's he is right in what he's saying it just needs to be he could work on the packaging a little bit in my opinion in my uh, most humble of opinions and guys that is our final Super chat. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate every one of you. Tomorrow we do have a video coming out. What was the, what did we film tomorrow's video about? I already forgot. <laughs> it's the cultural appropriation. Oh, cultural appropriation. Uh, a story about a sushi restaurant in New York that I think you guys will want to hear about. So that'll be coming out tomorrow. Can't wait for you guys to see it. Guys, if you like the stream, please like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time I'm live. That's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, and, you know, a whole slew of other times depending on where you are watching. As always, we post videos for you guys every single day. So there will be one out for you tomorrow and a little short coming out after this leave a comment down below how you felt about the topics we discussed in today's episode as always i encourage healthy debate so duke it out but do so respectfully and have a fantastic rest of your day see you next time guys